Alright, woo, hello. A voice from above. Please be seated. Okay, Mac and Mac and Mitchell, we're waiting on y'all. <laughs> we're waiting on y'all. Y'all were just easy. Y'all were just standing right in front of me. <laughs> Billy was just trying to hope for the attention. That's, Billy wants it, you know. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? We would like to welcome our president of the Georgia Lottery Corporation, Gretchen Corbin. Gretchen, the floor is yours. There you are now. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett and Tillery. It's always great to be with you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gretchen Corbin. I'm President and CEO of the Georgia Lottery Corporation. And to most of you, old, wonderful friends, and it is great to be with you today. I have to, Mr. Chairman, if I can, I'm going to take a quick um, personal privilege. I've met Andrew today, one of your great interns. Not only was he a Hope Scholar, but his grandfather did our prize valuation for a very long time. And so um, from the great area of Lawrenceville and a Southwest Georgian, Southwest Georgia student, um, Hope Scholar, his grandfather gave out the big prizes that we'll talk about today. I thought that was a great coincidence. So honored to be with all of you today and Andrew and the legacy that your grandfather provides us today. Thank you. Well, again, thank you to all members of this committee for your service to the state of Georgia and for the su support you provide to the Georgia Lottery Corporation. On behalf of Governor Kemp, the Georgia Lottery Board of Directors, our employees, and especially all of the Andrews in the world, our Hope and our pre-K students, and families who have benefited from your Georgia Lottery in the past 30 years, it's my privilege to provide you with the Georgia Lottery update. As you all know, the Georgia Lottery does not receive state appropriations, but it is our job to provide revenues back to the state for the governor and you to allocate for pre-K and um, our, our HOOP scholarship. This is Georgia Lottery's record. To date, with the inclusion of Q1 of fiscal year 24, the Georgia Lottery has now transferred more than $27.2 billion to education since inception. And those dollars have resulted in more than 2.1, 2.1 million HOPE scholars and more than 2 million pre-K students. This is our continued line of education proceeds from the Georgia Lottery Corporation. This is our annual transfer since 1994. In fiscal year 94, our first year of returns were $362 million. And as you know, returns have continued to grow. In fiscal year 23, our results were $1.516 billion. This was an increase of 42 million or 2.9% from the previous year. Fiscal year 23 was our eighth consecutive year to provide over $1 billion to the state. When we speak about profits to education, it's important that we discuss our product and how we generate those revenues. According to the numbers, your Georgia lottery is one of the most successful lotteries in the nation and throughout the world. And understanding that our mission is to responsibly grow revenues, we innovate daily through our product. As you know, Scratchers, Draw, and our iLottery platform. And we also innovate in all ways that we can with our retailers, through our sales locations, and our technology. We continue to be innovative with our instant product, including adding price points and launching four to six games every month. 
In Q1, we launched Quick Win, which if you have not seen it, it's a fresh new concept of instant play, instant win, that is available both at retail and online. And we continue to implement enhancements to our iLottery platform. Our interactive platform grew from $445 million in fiscal year 22 in sales to $782 million in fiscal year 23 which returned approximately $177 million in profit last year. As you can imagine, and as you see, we support our product launches and maintain our awareness of existing games through creative marketing initiatives. We had a great year this past year celebrating the Georgia Lottery's 30th anniversary last year. We offered three theme promotions to drive play and product sales. And of course, in addition to our product, we have regulatory authority for COAM, coin-operated amusement machines. And these responsibilities include licensing, permitting, collections, and compliance. We license over 35,000 machines statewide, which are all connected to a centralized accounting system. We receive a revenue share of 10% of net revenue from Class B machines, which equated to approximately $133 million to the bottom line last year. Well, these are our recent returns. As you can see, this slide shows a breakdown of the returns in the last 10 years since the Georgia Lottery Corporation assumed regulatory responsibilities for COAM from the Department of Revenue in 2013. The first five years um, share increased every year um, by 10% and that ended in fiscal year 20. And so you can see those numbers, how they have continued to grow for all years, but also between 20 and 23. Within your budget book, because I know that's where the most of you are spending um, your time today, lottery funds can be found on page 37 and within the estimated state revenues, which can also be found on page 15. Each quarter, the lottery transfers funds to the Georgia Lottery for Education account inside the Office of the State Treasurer, where it is then sent to OPB for allocation to HOPE and Pre-K. You have heard that we have had a strong fiscal year 23, and I want to provide you with a quick update as to how we are doing in fiscal year 24. Most importantly, we're off to a solid start. Our year-to-day profit as of Q1 is $388 million, and this was our second largest Q1 transfer in lottery history. Our year-to-date interactive sales are $209.5 million, which is 21% higher than prior year. I will say our Q1 sales and profits were boosted by three large jackpot rolls, which you probably saw. But the most important number you will want to leave with today is our current projected year-end profit for fiscal year 24, and that is $1.535 billion. And with our Q1 transfer, that, brings, that will bring the total raised since inception for Hope and Pre-K after Q1 to $27.2 billion. So as legislators, I always want to, well, I, I always want to be transparent with you. Um, and today, I'm in the great position of stating to you that the Georgia Lottery is continuing our success and that we feel very comfortable with our budget, um, our budget number for this year. Our commitment is to always follow the guidance of Governor Kemp and the legislature to transfer the greatest amount of revenues to the state possible and to be a transparent, transparent resource to any legislative member and committee. As I wrap up, I wanna make sure that I say that it's Tuesday. So tonight's Mega Million jackpot is at $208 million. So please make sure to get your tickets. Chairman Hatchett and Chairman Tillery, this concludes my presentation and I'm absolutely always happy to answer any question you or the members may have. Thank you, Ms. Corbin. Um, Chairman Hickman. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Uh, give us an update on the uh, cash card for the COAM machines. Where, where are we at on that? How, how successful it is and so forth and so on. Thank you, that's a very good question. Um, so our pilot that we've had with our COAM gift card um, has been um, 
pretty popular throughout the COAM industry as well as our COAM players. Um, and so I will have to bring those exact numbers to you of where the numbers that the cards are in. We'll definitely get those numbers to you, but I would say that a lot of our COAM operators have enjoyed it as well as our players. So how, how far are we as far as implementation on all the machines or all the, all the stores? Everyone has the ability at this point, um, the COAM locations, if they wanted to participate in the program, to be able to participate. Well, I, I've actually had a couple of convenience store people tell me that they've, they've been on a list for six months and still have not received any kind of authorization on it. So I'm, I'm more than happy to touch base with those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Huffstetler. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, and it's great to have a fellow Roman here today and knowing you in your 20-something uh, years. That My 29, you, did you say? 29, is that what it was? I said 20-something. I wasn't going to say 29. <laughs> makes me look old. Anyway, I've got a question uh, with, I know you mentioned the COAMs pay 10%, and that's correct, but it's 10% of the adjusted gross, whereas the HOPE is the gross number. So if you look at the gross number, they pay 3% of sales to us and, and hope ticket sales are about 28 cents on the dollar they're paying so roughly you know one ninth as much money we've got other potential things out there that we're looking at do you guys look at these and evaluate them it seems like while sales are up they're not really keeping up with inflation and i'm worried about lower paying things cannibalizing the 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 stuff that funds our universities. Do you have guys do any data or any studying of that kind of thing? We do not, we regulate COAM, so we don't operate them and we don't set kind of that, that prize evaluation. And so therefore, um, and so for the money out that is then distributed between, um, between those, those pieces and then of course the 10% of net that comes to the Georgia Lottery. I will say that, of course, within our games that we are responsible for, as you know, and as I've mentioned before, draw brings in a larger percentage than scratch does. And so we are constantly balancing those. We see our responsibility as getting that greatest return to you possible, um, but always the largest dollar first to you. Leader Beverly, are you going to ask a question to everybody today? Pretty much. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I had that right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to my dear friend. Mr. Hey, Later. <laughs> you're doing great. Uh, I have a couple of serious questions about, um, about COAM and as it relates to sports betting as well. And so if you can help me work through that, it'd be helpful. Um, I know that you guys are responsible for the regulatory oversight of COAM. And recently, Lucky Bucks just had this big thing, the RICO that happened with Lucky Bucks and their restructuring the company. Obviously, that's not your fault. But, but the question I have for you around that is, why did we, how did we miss that? And then if we were, if, and maybe it's not a part of what you do, but if we were to have oversight over that and we missed this sort of RICO thing that's going on right now, are we really ready for the lottery to take over sports betting if that were to come online? Well, I'll answer the second question okay. first, if you don't mind. And that is that, of course, I see that as a public policy decision. And whatever you determine, um, whatever you and the governor determine, we will follow state statute just as we have for the last 30 years. Um, in regards to the Lucky Bucks case, um, we, any time that we hear that there are, you know, if we receive a tip from the industry, we of course, we go out, we have investigators within our staff and we go and we look at that. It's very important for COAM's credibility because we think even though we regulate, that's our credibility as well. Um, and so, um, we'll wait to see, you know, where that goes, but I can ensure you, I can assure you it's, we are playing, we are always making sure that we're being business friendly to COAM operators, even though we regulate them, but we take our regulation responsibilities um, very strongly as well. And so when we receive a tip, we always send our investigators out. Last one, Chairman Houston. Anyway, I'm, I don't play COAM. What a what a what are your COAM gift cards? What is that? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Madam Chair. Nice to see you. Good to see you. 
Thank you. Um, so COAM, as you know, again, we regulate our co um, coin-operated amusement machines. And how, in do, 20 how do you get them? Ma'am? How do you get them? We, so it's a form of redemption. In the past, you could only redeem, you could play COAM, and if you won COAM, you could redeem it for a lottery ticket uh, or for credit in the, in the store. Now, when you win um, on COAM, you have the ability to go to the clerk and they hand you a gift card with those winnings on it. But on those winnings on COAM, don't we just get 3% of those winnings? How much do we get back on the lottery? Is that good business? The lottery receives per statute 10% of um, COAM. But we, don't, we get 10% of COAM, but we, have, we pay COAM dealers some money. So 10% of the net, yes. Of the net, and then we pay, we only, how much do we pay the COAM dealer? So when there's 100% of the profit, when you have, once the profit, obviously you pay the prize, the, the player is paid out. And then of the 100% profit, 45% goes to the location, 45 cents goes to the master license, mm -hmm. who's putting the machines in the locations, 10% um, goes to the lottery. Um, so I'm sorry, that is after prizes are paid and our vendor is paid. Then 45% goes to the, li the location, 45% goes to the master licensee, and 10% goes to the Georgia Lottery. Okay, how much should we make on a lottery ticket? They're different based on whether it's a draw ticket, but what? on average, anywhere from 17 to 20 cents. Okay, so if we're making 17 to 20 percent, we're not making as much given in that pro-am ticket if they, they took a lottery ticket, right? At this point, per statute, we receive 10 percent of the, of the profit. Well, th at this point, it would be better to give them another lottery ticket because we'd make more money. The state of Georgia would probably receive right. a greater percentage. Senator Lucas. Isn't it true that if you do the uh, gift cards, that if the gift card is given wherever they take it, sales tax is taken out of it, isn't it? I'm sorry, Senator. I say if you give a gift card, which is outside redemption in the store, when they take it and use it, they have to pay sales tax on it. That is correct. And the, now, is that a mandatory tax that, that we put on the folks, or it's a tax that they they have to pay because they got a gift card to get something, so they had to pay the sales tax on that particular item? Am I correct? Correct. So, if you take what you're doing with COAM, which is ten percent off the top. 10% off the top. Then you got the 45 with the master license and 45 with the, the store. Who pays the maintenance costs on those Cornell machines? I believe the master license do. The master license. So therefore the master license holder doesn't get the 10%, but he, after he get his 45, out of that 45, he has to pay his employees and everybody or what we call technicians to work on the machines. Yes, sir. All right. That's all the questions. Thank you. Gretchen. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you very much. Next up is Lynn Riley, the president of the Georgia Student Finance Commission. Have a good evening. Here's your clicker, Matt. Uh, it sure has. All of my children benefited as well. So a wonderful thing and wonderful to be able to hang it forward a little bit.
President. Okay, I'll stay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get going again. Uh, President Riley, I don't know if it was by skill or by chance that you were next, but uh, if you <laughs> want to go ahead and go, you're up. Good afternoon, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett. Thank you so much. I think it was by uh, skill that I'm lucky enough to follow President Corbin and talk a little bit more about what we do at Student Finance Commission with all the proceeds that she sends our way. I'll start off with some facts and, and some data that many of you know about, but some new and, and great news. Uh, 2.1 million students have benefited from the HOPE Scholarship since 1993 when the program was initiated, and it continues to receive national recognition for what it has done for our state's public uh, and private post-secondary institutions and our economy as a whole. Uh, to date, we have given out over $14.6 billion in awards, and we are likely to pass the $15 billion mark before we hit June 30 this year. That's a lot of investment that's been made over time for a lot of great young minds, and I'm delighted as well to meet Andrew today and know of another uh, beneficiary who has advanced into the workforce with some distinction. I know you've heard from the Chancellor and from the Commissioner about our Georgia Match program, and, and the Student Finance Commission is honored to be the administrators of this program. To date, 132,000 letters have gone out to Georgia high school seniors. Tens of thousands have visited their Georgia Match dashboard to determine the choices that they might have to learn in Georgia and thousands of spots have already been claimed, as you heard earlier today. Uh, applications that have been submitted to post-secondary institutions have gone up this year as a result, and we are very proud to be delivering on Governor Kemp's vision uh, of this program and the partnership that has been forged with the education agencies for this success. But this year, we're not done yet. Next month, postcards will be mailed to all the high school seniors who have not taken advantage of claiming their spot or taken action to apply to one of the institutions in the state. And we'll be reminding them that application fee waivers will be available for them in March. We want to multiply the numbers that you've already heard today of students that take advantage of direct admission to Georgia's college and universities. As you know, Georgia Match provides a roadmap for every Georgia high school student to find their best spot to learn in Georgia and then to earn in Georgia. Student Finance assists them all with financial aid programs to minimize their out-of-pocket costs and reduce their student debt. The next slide is some statistics on the dual enrollment program. Uh, we've heard about the growth in enrollment at our post-secondary institutions and that has been evidenced to us by the growth in the awards that we are uh, providing for our students. This slide and the next one's coming are uh, comparative year over year for the first six months of each year. And as you can see, the dual enrollment program through December 31st is rebounding significantly. We already have more dual enrollment students participating this current academic year than in prior full years, and we're just starting the spring semester. Uh, for the last five years, uh, we've been putting money out, and in the current fiscal year, we have already dispersed 10 million more than we did in the comparable period last year, and that is 63% of our fiscal FY24 program appropriation. The growth in award dollars is not attributable to any changes in tuition or award amounts. It's rather due to the increased enrollment and credit hours that are being taken utilizing the dual enrollment dollars. And this is consistent with what we've been hearing from our post-secondary partners about overall enrollment growth. The HOPE grant programs are on a similar trajectory. As you recall, the HOPE grant award rate was raised from 90 to 100% for FY24. And through December, total grant program awards were 31% more than comparable period in the prior year. Enrollment rates and the number of credit hours earned have risen across all of the grant types, the HOPE, the Zell Miller, and the HOPE Career Grant. The HOPE Scholarship Program for private post-secondary institution is showing cost increases consistent with the increased award amount for FY24. We've seen a small increase in credit hours invoiced as well. 
The cost for the Zellmiller Scholarship Program for private institutions is flat compared to FY23 so far this year. As you can see in this slide, the Hope and Zellmiller Scholarship Awards at public colleges and universities are a higher year to date than FY24 over all prior years, mostly due to the increase in the award rate to 100% of tuition for our Hope Scholars. Enrollment growth is also a factor, as well as an increase in credit hours invoiced through December 31st. Moving to the details of our amended 24 and FY25 governor's budget recommendations, I'll start with commission administration. An increase of 120,000 in the amended budget is to provide the one-time salary supplement to employees for recruitment and retention. The FY25 increases total 300,000 and it comprised of the statewide uh, COLA and increased to retirement funding, insurance and merit system costs. The governor's recommendation of an increase of 12.3 million for dual enrollment in FY2024 and 15.1 million for FY25 are indicative of the growth that we have seen in the enrollment in this program. The Hope High School Equivalency Program appropriation is flat for FY24 and is reduced in FY25 by 845,000 based on program utilization projections. Similarly, the HOPE grant program is recommended flat for FY24 and has been reduced in FY25 by $20.7 million, which Chair Mr. Chairman and members, quite frankly, will likely need to be revisited based on what we have seen as a, a remarkable growth in HOPE grant, as Commissioner Dozier has spoken about the remarkable increase in enrollment at the technical colleges. The Hope Scholarship can I, can Private interrupt? Program, can I, Mr. Chairman. Would you like to elaborate on that a little more is, since there is a reduction and how, how the demand seems to be increasing and maybe reflect on how those numbers might have come about? Or, thank, do, you not, or well, do you not want to do that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The original projections that we looked at were based on FY23, which was just a little over $51 million that were uh, actually spent in FY23. Uh, student Finance recommended a base amount of $80 million that was originally provided in the original FY24 budget, not being real sure where we might shake out, but hearing anecdotally and then seeing the invoices arrive that was significantly more than that 51 million in FY23. Uh, the adjustment made in FY25 could potentially be based on that FY23 amount, but it's clear that that won't be sufficient to provide for the demand that we're seeing in 25. For the HOPE Scholarship a Private Program, the appropriation reflects a reduction of $16.8 million in the amended budget. That aligns with the Governor's disregard language in the original FY24 bill. The FY25 recommendation reflects a reduction of $16.4 million in alignment with the FY24 disregard language as well, but a little bit less for the award rates that were set in the FY24 final budget of 2,496 for Hope Private and 2,985 an award for Zell Miller Private Scholarships. The HOPE Scholarship Public Program recommendation is flat in the amended budget and reduced by $9.1 million in FY25 based on program utilization projections. The low interest loan program is flat for the amended 24 budget, and as this is the final year of the program, the appropriation is zeroed out in the FY25 recommendation. The service canceled loan program appropriation is reduced by 3.2 million in the amended budget. This is removing the appropriation for the peace officer loan repayment program that legislation was not adopted last year. However, the $3.2 million is restored in the FY25 budget recommendation to align with the governor's legislative agenda for this current year. The college completion grant program recommendation for the amended budget shows a reduction of $2 million, reflecting disregard language in the original 24 budget bill, and this reduction is included also in the FY25 recommendation. Our tax agency, the Georgia Non-Public Post-Secondary Education Commission, 
shows an increase of 30,000 in the amended budget, 10,000 of that for the one-time $1,000 salary supplement, and 20,000 for an upgrade to the online database management system for the, the attached agency. The FY25 budget includes an increase of 46,000 for the pro proposed statewide COLA and retirement cost increases. In total, the amended 24 budget for the agency proposes a reduction of 9.5 million and for the FY25 budget recommendation is 53.7 million less than FY2024 at $1.172 billion. Mr. Chairman, the exceptional professionals of the Georgia Student Finance Commission work every day to provide Georgia students with guidance on their best choices for a successful, cost-effective post-secondary education right here in Georgia as they navigate their journey into adulthood and our robust workforce that continues to receive international recognition. I thank you for the opportunity to bring some great news to you today, and I'm ready to happy and very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Can you back up one slide? So of those, no, uh, that sorry. one. What percent of those funds for each year are composed of lottery funds? Are you funded totally by lottery funds or is it just portion? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Our total. And you don't have to give me exactly. But. Well, uh, for FY25, lottery funds are a, mil a billion, 22 million. State general funds, 135 million. And other funds which are primarily composed of reserve funds that we carry over year to year, about 14 million. So with, with, with the balances in the lottery fund, I would think it, it's, it would, there possibly be money there to fund any shortfall that you might see coming in 25 or the future. Certainly, I would not be surprised that there'd be consideration of additional lottery dollars available to fund the growing demand for HOPE programs that we provide. Any questions? Wow, that's a first for today. Nobody has any questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Next up is Commissioner Amy Jacobs with the Department of Early Care and Learning. How you doing? Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's good to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to first provide you, before I get into the governor's budget recommendations, just a brief overview of what DECAL does and the programs that we operate. I'm sure you probably know us best for Georgia's pre-K program, which is uh, our pre-K program in Georgia that's in its 31st year. It's in every county in Georgia and we're currently serving about 71,000 four-year-olds, but we do a lot um, more than that at DECAL to support early learning in Georgia. Uh, we license and regulate about 4,500 child care programs throughout the state. We also have a quality rated program which allows these child care programs to go above and beyond basic minimum licensing requirements to really bring in that quality early learning component, which we know is so important for early brain development. And about 63% of our licensed programs are quality rated. We also administer our CAPS program, which is our Child Care and Parent Services program, which is the state's subsidy program, which helps pay the child care costs for families with low income so they can go to work or go to school and their children can attend high quality early learning. Uh, nutrition services, we operate two USDA funded programs. One is CACFP, which is Child and Adult Care Food Program, where we work with uh, child care programs and adult care programs throughout the state for them to provide free meals to their clients. And last year we were able to reimburse for about 65 million meals throughout the state. We also operate uh, a summer food program, which we call Happy Helpings. We know during the summer, school-age students don't have access to meals since they're not in school, and so we work with nonprofits throughout the state uh, to reimburse them for meals, and last summer they were able to serve 2.8 million meals to these school-age students. Uh, we also offer inclusion services to child care programs. We have a team of 
inclusion and behavior support specialists that work directly with child care programs and teachers as they work to include children with all ability levels and even challenging behaviors in their classrooms. Uh, for infant and toddler supports, we have a group of infant and toddler specialists that provide direct coaching to infant and toddler teachers. And then, of course, we have several quality initiatives and professional development programs that support child care teachers, one of those being what we call DECAL Scholars that provides incentives and scholarships directly to child care teachers uh, as they go back and get additional credentials and degrees. So I will move on to uh, the governor's budget recommendation for DECAL. We are on page 169. I'll start with the amended 24 budget. Uh, this first one is in child care services, and this is the uh, $1,000 salary supplement for full-time benefit eligible employees. I'll move quickly to the next slide, which is nutrition services, which is also on page 169. Uh, that first one is the $1,000 supplement. The second one is to provide startup grants to uh, providers throughout the state to help us expand our summer meal service. As I mentioned, we administer Happy Helpings, which serve 2.8 million meals to school-age students uh, during the summer when they don't have access to those school cafeterias. We've had success in this in the past by providing startup grants. Uh, we heard from what one barrier from some of these nonprofits is they just can't get it started up. They can't buy a refrigerator or coolers or hire staff. And so we did have some success with some one-time funding we received the last few years and were able to provide 22 grants and serve an additional 112,000 meals. And so we are excited uh, and pleased to see this additional 100,000 to help us uh, recruit more sponsors this summer by providing them with some startup grants to get those summer programs up and running. In our pre-kindergarten program, uh, the first is the $1,000 uh, salary supplement. Number two is to provide funds for a computer refresh for our pre-K team. Uh, we have not had a uh, computer refresh in about four years. This is about two-thirds of that cost. You'll see the other part in the uh, FY25 budget. Uh, number three is to increase funds to reflect the correct employer contribution rate for SHPP. Obviously, the public school teachers that teach in Georgia pre-K classes receive SHBP. There was an increase in that percentage last year, and this just trues that up. So this is the amount of money that we will send directly to local school systems so they can pay their SHBP bill. And number four is an increase in funds to expand our summer transition program. So our summer transition program is part of Georgia's pre-K program. It is a much smaller program. Um, but it is a five-week program in the summer for two sets of students, uh, one for rising kindergarten, so students that need extra support before they enter kindergarten. Uh, they could have attended pre-K and have been identified by their teachers as needing a little extra support, maybe didn't attend a full year, maybe moved into, into the area and they need that, uh, that boost before they begin pre-K. And we also have a rising pre-K program, which is for Spanish-speaking students primarily um, who need an extra five weeks before they enter Georgia pre-K. This is a smaller program, as I mentioned, but the $6 million would allow us uh, to expand from 222 classes, which is what we served in FY19 pre-pandemic, to 288 classes. And I can't say enough about this program. Just with a five-week program, we actually have results uh, in a study and research that shows that they make gains across all domains of learning. So it's a really important program, even though it is small uh, for a very specific part uh, set of students. Also on page 169 is uh, the $1,000 salary supplement. Now I will move to FY25, which is also on page 169, uh, the Child Care Services Program. One, two, and three are all the statewide adjustments that I'm sure you have seen all day. And number four is an increase of funds to raise our CAPS reimbursement rates to the 50th percentile. As I mentioned, our CAPS program is the state's subsidy program, uh, which pays for child care for families with low incomes as they work or go to school and the children um, attend high quality early learning. Our CAPS rates are very, very low and don't come close to uh, meeting the cost of high quality child care. So this will increase uh, that to the 50th percentile of market rates. Now on page 170, which is where the pre-kindergarten program starts, uh, this page, all four of these are the statewide changes for uh, the cost of living, TRS, GBA, and then GTA. So uh, also on page 170, are, these are the remainder of the pre-K program recommendations. Uh, one is the remainder to put in the base money for a computer refresh. 
As you know, we need to do that every several years, and that money has not been in our base previously, so we can support our staff that support pre-K teachers all throughout the state. Uh, number six is the expansion of their summer transition program. You saw this in the amended budget. This would allow us to continue to expand even next summer and put it in our base so we can serve the additional students in those two uh, summer transition programs. Number seven is the increase of $2,500 for both lead and assistant teachers for Georgia Pre-K, which uh, we are grateful that that matches the K-12 teacher increase that Governor Kemp has proposed. Uh, number eight is an increase in formula funds for teacher training and experience, just like K-12 has their T&E schedule that provides increases for training and experience. Pre-K has the same, and this recognizes $1.2 million. Number nine is increased funds uh, to phase in a classroom reduction. Uh, and I am very, very excited about this. Pre-K has been at 22 students since about 2011. Uh, before that, it was at 20. When we went through HOPE reform and the HOPE cuts back in 2010, um, that was one of the adjustments that had to be made to cut funding. So we were at 22 students. Uh, we know that smaller class sizes are really important, especially for small children. This will come in line with the national standards, with even our Georgia kindergarten standards. We know it's better for students and teachers, and it allows those teachers really to provide that individualized instruction that these four-year-olds need and will benefit from. What we plan to do, this would be an increase of about 400 classrooms throughout the state. So we'll have to phase this in. So this would be the first year of a four-year phase in for about $10.9 million, where we would add about 96 classrooms around the state to do that. So uh, we are excited about the opportunity to reduce our class size. Number 10 is an increase of funds to upgrade our provider management system. Of course, we collect lots and lots of data. Uh, we send out lots and lots of money to pre-K providers and pre-K classrooms. Our system is about 20 years old, so it is old. We have a lot of manual processes, and this will automate a lot of processes, which will be better for our staff, uh, but also for pre-K program providers. And then the last change in our budget is an increase in formula funds to recognize uh, the increase in the per member per month rate for certified teachers for SHBP of about $2.4 million. And Mr. Chairman, those are all of our changes. Of course, I'm happy to take any questions. You have a few. Okay. Chairman Hickman. I'll just start gates to fast. Um, thank you for being here. Um, two quick questions. First of all, you know, uh, you and I have talked about this, that of the lottery funded pre-K programs of the schools, there's 92% of those classes are filled, of, of, of the available classrooms. 92% of them are filled with, with kids. What concerns me, we've got probably 150,000 pre-K kids in Georgia, and of the total population, only 61% of those children are in a lottery funded pre-K program. So we got probably 55 to 60,000 kids every day that are, that are pre-K ages that are not in a, not, not in a lottery funded program. So we need to look at, look at expanding that, obviously. The second statement is, when we reduce this class size from 22 to 20, and we've only got one classroom at a particular school, where are those two kids going to, and how, how are they going? Be, be that's going to be uh, that's going to be a, a, a puzzle. We will our guarantee is that we will continue to serve more children, and we will make sure that we increase the number of classes. We may have to move. We don't know. We'll have to move kids from certain to, from a certain school to a certain school because we have to get as close as we can to 20 because we're funded at the class level, not at the student level. Um, but it will be a puzzle when we see the applications come in uh, every year, which is it's a puzzle every year for us to make sure that students are in the right place, uh, in the right class with the right teacher. So it's not that we all of a sudden gonna take those two kids and make them stay at home. We are not gonna do that. That is, you have my word on that. That is not our intent at all. Our, our intent is actually to help this help us serve more kids because lower class size is also important to parents. Thank you. Chairman Houston. Uh, yes, uh, Speaker Burns had appointed a committee to look into the pre-K funding and different aspects of pre-K. Did you take in effect the recommendations that they had made when you made this budget? I did not because um, they just 
announced it about 30 minutes ago oh, all okay. the recommendations okay. right. um, and you. we were we worked I with I heard s- some talk about it and knew you worked with it was them. about 30 minutes ago okay all um, right. of course well, speaker pro tem jones sure kept us, can, she kept t- us in the loop and yeah. uh, we support her recommendations and yeah. we're happy to work with you all as you yeah. consider this as well it would really make a big difference agree. in pre-k according to georgia agree because some of the funding had been changed in lots and lots of years you're right yes thank you yes. <laughs> Chairman Huffstetler. My question is really pretty similar to Chairman Hickman. The same thing is my concern is we've got, and I'll tell you, I believe this is the most important education for our children. If we get them behind here, they never catch up. But we've got all those children that can't get in the program and yet we're reducing the class size. It seems like we would use the fund to get some of those children that can't get in pre-K into the classroom before we start reducing class size instead of leaving all them. Well, I think we've got to do it at the same time. I think some of Speaker Pro Tem Jones's recommendations will help us with that capacity because what we're seeing is where the kids are, where we have the highest wait list, we don't have the physical classrooms and we need to provide some type of financial incentive to public schools or providers to to open additional classrooms. So I think they kind of work hand in hand. Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question around regarding informal in-home uh, child care. Uh, so the number on the caps is 4.6 million. That seems awfully low just to get us to 50 percentile. What is the actual number that would get us into the 90 percentile, 100 hundred percentile? Um, I cannot give you that off the top of my head. I will say that the additional state funds will be combined with about $60 million in federal funds to get us to the 50th percentile. So that's about $65 million to get us to the 50th percentile. Uh, we can get you that number, we can do that calculation for you, but I don't have that off the top of my head. That'd be great, just a quick follow up. The, uh, so the designation, so in-home, uh, inform, in-home provider, would they, be, would they be allowed to take advantage of the CAPS money if they were designated as uh, Yes, we do, have, we do have informal providers that do uh, accept CAPS and we do pay them our CAPS rate. Yes, Thanks. we do, yes. Senator Parent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Commissioner Jacobs. I wanted to um, ask just a little bit more about CAPS. Curious how many kids we are currently serving and for an update on some of the funding status. I recall that the governor made what I thought was a wise decision to put 100 million or, or something of that nature from pandemic funds into CAPS. Can you give us an update on where we are is that money just going yes. away? What are the, what are the numbers we're yes. talking about now that we can serve? So there have been a couple adjustments to CAPS with the pandemic funding, which will continue through September of this year. Uh, we increased the number of children we serve from 50,000 to 70,000. Uh, we will have to reduce that slowly through natural attrition. You know, of course, children enter and leave the program on a daily basis for whatever reason. So we will slowly attrition that back to 50,000. Right now, we are also paying the full cost of child care with some of our pandemic funding. So our CAPS budget right now is about $450 million. When we don't do that, it's $280 million. But that money will end and it expires September of 2024, which means that families will have more out-of-pocket expenses for child care at that time. So that's a fairly dramatic um, rollback of that program. Yes. Well, that's a shame. Representative Oliver. Thank you. In the last budget cycle or so, we appropriated money to assist you to have folks do calls, crisis calls on behavioral issues. There are still thousands of children who are expelled from pre-K. Are those positions filled, and what are you learning about the mental health needs of the four-year-olds coming into your program? So we did we receive we received funding uh, in our pre-K budget several years ago to inc- to increase our inclusion staff, and then we also have the state's mental health director that we received state funding from a few years ago. We're definitely seeing in- yes, those positions are filled. Uh, in addition to. A- more positions that are filled with our federal dollars. We have a whole unit of inclusion and behavior support specialists that work directly with teachers and with children with challenging behavior because we're absolutely seeing more of that as everyone comes out of the pandemic and gets back into a routine in childcare. 
We've also um, started what we call a SEEDS helpline, which a child care provider, a teacher, a parent can call if they need access to additional services for their children. We can either go in the classroom and work with the teacher, which is our primary responsibility. That's what we have the staff capacity to do uh, and the knowledge base to do is work directly with the teacher. Um, but we can also refer out to other services. Uh, we're also piloting what we call a mental health consultation pilot where we'll do even more um, provide even more services uh, directly to teachers and even to families. That's a pilot at this point with some of our federal COVID dollars, uh, but we recognize that as a need because we are seeing an increase in challenging behaviors and calls from teachers needing our support. Do you think your expulsion rate is the same, going up or going down? You know, down? I don't have a read on our expulsion rate. We don't usually allow expulsion in Georgia's pre-K program. It is discouraged. They have to go through a very lengthy process with us. Now, if a child care program expels a student, we wouldn't have any, any say-so over that. But in Georgia pre-K, uh, we highly discourage it, and we do not have a high number of those because it's quite a process. We, provide, we try to provide the supports before that even comes to our, our desk for any type of consideration. Last question. Representative Evans, is that you? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you. So um, I wanted to just go back to your, the, the pre-K. And um, so you said there are 400 classrooms across the state, and this is a phased approach. So this $10 million or ten million nine seventy that will go to open up 96 yes, classrooms yes. this year. This year. Well, next okay. school year, yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then, and then just to confirm what Senator Parent was asking about, so there is no increase in CAPS, in CAPS slots. There is no year. increase in CAPS slots, no. And I know I get that question a lot, and we've really got to focus on what we pay providers right now because you've all heard the news. Child care is expensive, as it should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, we want high-quality teachers who deserve to pay, deserve to be paid, uh, you know, more than a living wage. So childcare is expensive. So I'm really focusing right now on increasing the rates we pay to providers to provide quality childcare. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I've got a question. Um, as we're talking about caps, I understand that the the formula prior to the pandemic, or the funding prior to the pandemic, was around 260 to 280 million a year. Now we're up around 450. Make sure I understand CAPS correctly. We basically allocate a certain amount of money per child to each provider, right? Like, so it, it's, it's on a per, cap, a per head basis, right? That is correct. Okay. That is, so the can, child receives a scholarship, well, the family receives a scholarship based on their eligibility, income, and work requirement, and then they can take that scholarship to any provider, and we pay our rate. Right now, we pay the full provider rate, so what the provider is fully charging. Right. When we go back, it will be what we can pay, which is we'll be at the 50th percentile if this recommendation stands. Can you help us know the difference in what the rate we were paying and the rate we're paying now? Yes. Sorry. It's on a different sheet. <laughs> um, I can tell you annually, just, and this is an average because we're talking about infants and toddlers and we're talking about school age, which are a lot less expensive than, infant, than an infant toddler. So um, before the pandemic dollars, we pay about $5,600 a year per, per child. Per child. Uh, right now, we're paying $8,400 a year per child. Gotcha. And the parent can pick whatever. It has to be quality rated and right. licensed, of course, but yes, they can choose as long as they're registered in CAPS and a CAPS provider. Yes, they can choose. Gotcha. Thank you. That's all the questions. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Next up is Commissioner Tyler Harper, Department of Agriculture. And we're back on time. So Commissioner, let's keep it that way, okay? I'll do my best, Mr. Chairman. It's all dependent on the number of questions I get. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is, uh, it's good to see you, all of you. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, when we were together in December, uh, I gave you a pretty good overview of where we are and where we're going as an agency and what we've been spending the money on that you have appropriated to us last session. So obviously we're going to focus on the future in this presentation and, and where we are going forward um, and uh, uh, just have a conversation about, uh, about our FY24 uh, amended and, and uh, 
as well as our 25 budget. Um, just kind of really quick, I always like to do this because uh, I think most people don't really realize all the things that we do at the Department of Agriculture uh, and the role that we play in, in lives every single day. Um, I argue that we're one of the only, if not the uh, one of the only uh, state agencies, if not the only state agency that impacts every Georgian every day. Uh, every single day, a Georgian is impacted by the work that we do at the Department of Agriculture from farms, fuel pumps, gas pumps, grocery stores, and everything in between. And uh, our employees, about 500 strong, go to work every single day to, to execute that mission. Um, with our over 70 licenses that we issue and 20 different divisions that we have uh, as an agency. Um, we're about 81% funded with state dollars, 19% funded with federal dollars. Uh, most of those federal dollars obviously go to pay those joint programs that we operate with the federal government, uh, such as meat inspection uh, and, uh, and other food safety related uh, programs among things like pesticides as well with the EPA money uh, and the, the, the agreements we have uh, there. Um, we also get funding in our budget that goes to attached agencies. Uh, and so that money just flows through the Department of Agriculture, uh, like the uh, Ag Exposition Authority in Perry. Uh, we have the, uh, the vet labs that go through us. The poultry diagnostic lab is attached to us. Uh, you know, all the, the commodity commissions uh, operate under us. The Soil and Water Conservation Commission operates under our administrative authority. So all of that money that is uh, appropriated to those entities just flows through us. Um, uh, so that's kind of a, a quick overview. I know uh, uh, Commissioner Jacobs mentioned mental health, and I know that's been a big thing that has been a lot of conversation. And I don't think I talked about this in December, but at the agency and, and has been a, a priority of mine, uh, we have stepped up our efforts in relation to mental health related to rural Georgia, related to farmers, related to farm families. What we have found over the last few years, especially in the recent study, that uh, is troubling. Uh, Forty percent of farmers uh, in the last 12 months when the study was done this past year have thought about suicide. And those are troubling, troubling numbers. And when you think about where we are in the agricultural industry today, it kind of uh, you, you understand where that comes from. But uh, so at the department, we're 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 focusing on working with DBHDD and Commissioner Tanner and appreciate the partnership we have with him and the University of Georgia and really ramping up our efforts in relation to mental health when it's focused specifically in the ag sector uh, and helping those families. So we, we look forward to continuing that, that work uh, as well. So diving off into the budget and the governor's budget and uh, AFY 24, uh, he, uh, they included uh, increase of funds for the EV charging program, which many of you know passed in Senate Bill 146 last year, which is now law. Uh, it goes into effect of January 1st this next year. Uh, this specific uh, funding is a little over $3.3 million for equipment uh, for us to purchase. Uh, obviously, with it being in the amended budget and it being cash, that means we would have to spend this before June 30. Uh, so $3.3 million uh, to buy the equipment needed by June 30. Um, I will say, uh, you know, that that could be that might be a little bit of a, 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 a tough thing to do, but we will do what we're asked to do as an agency. Um, we're obviously uh, know this is an emerging market. Uh, we're going to uh, handle the tasks that we're asked to, to handle. Uh, but this is uh, uh, obviously needed for us um, because the, the program, we, we, uh, January 1st is the start date, and we want to make sure we're up and running to do that, and we appreciate the governor's recognition of the need we have for that equipment. Um, as, uh, as, uh, as Chancellor Purdue already said, uh, we have the, the governor put the money in for the one-time $1,000 supplement. That money's out the door, so I hope y'all do fund that, as he mentioned earlier, because uh, we've already spent that as well. Uh, we appreciate that for our employees. That goes a long way for recruitment and retention, uh, and we look forward to our continued work together to, to work on those uh, efforts. Uh, in the uh, FY25 uh, budget, uh, as with all state employees, we also received the 4% uh, pay raise at the department. We're very appreciative of that uh, because that will go a long ways in helping us continue our recruitment 
efforts. Uh, the other thing that is uh, really important to point out is the additional $2,000 that the governor included in their budget for specific pay raises for those in our consumer protection division, specifically our inspector level positions. Um, as I've mentioned to many of you whenever I was before you many times, uh, I have mentioned the number of vacancies we have at the Department of Agriculture. The majority, the great majority of those vacancies are in our inspector level positions, which makes it difficult for us to do our job. Over 80 vacancies department wide. Um, and so these targeted investments in our people will help us address that issue. Uh, these, uh, and, and so we're very appreciative of this additional investment and our, our folks at the department, and it's something that I've been asking for, and I would hope that you would continue to support, uh, and we continue to look for ways to help our, our folks at the department out and continue to bring them uh, up. Currently, I think I've mentioned this before, our base salary for a four-year college degree currently today right now is 39.5. So if you graduate with a bachelor's degree from college, our base salary for that person coming to work for the department is $39,500. So this 4% plus the 2,000 will get us above 43,000, which is, which is heading in the right direction for us. And we're very appreciative of that and those efforts and appreciate the governor's recognition of that help. And we just wanna continue those conversations. Uh, we also uh, received the enhancements for post-certified law enforcement officers uh, for those in our, in our department. We, in, we also received, as many state agencies did, the increased funds to address the adjustments that, are, that we will be having to make regarding our payments to DOAS, GBA, and the Technology Authority as well. Uh, getting the more specific in issue, uh, things in our budget related specifically to the department, uh, the governor included funds for 10 inspector positions to implement the EV charging program, the electric vehicle charging program, which again, as I mentioned a minute ago, will start on January 1st under current law. Uh, and so this will help give us the needed people uh, and vehicles needed to ensure that they can hit the ground running. Uh, when you combine that with the, uh, the other funding um, uh, for uh, uh, EVs, uh, that, that ensures that we're able to, to, to head in the right direction. I will say, though, regarding the electric vehicle program, when I was before you last year, the chargers or the testing equipment that we were looking at as an agency, uh, was uh, they were cost around $50,000. Today, that same testing equipment is over $150,000. So just in a year's time, we have seen the equipment that we, we would be required to purchase as an agency triple in cost, uh, which is a concern of ours, obviously. Um, and so uh, when, you, when you start putting pencil to paper and figuring out exactly where we need to be, uh, it, it, uh, that's something I think we need to have a, a real uh, in-depth conversation about. Uh, my staff and our team, we've pegged the cost of the electric vehicle program to the agency, cost of vehicles, equipment, personnel, and everything. Obviously, some of this is one-time cost to around $7.5 million. Uh, so we are very appreciative of the governor and his staff and the work that we've done together to get some uh, resources that we need. Uh, but we need to have an honest conversation about ensuring that we're, we're funding the program to give us the resources we need to be successful. We don't want to... Uh, work to implement a program and not have the tools and resources we need to ensure that it is implemented correctly. And that's what we just want to hope to have that conversation as we continue to move forward. Um, as many of you know, and I've mentioned this uh, last uh, in December, uh, in partnership with the Department of Natural Resources, as well as USDA and our conservation districts and friends there, we have uh, stood up the Feral Hog Task Force specifically working to address issues related to feral hogs in our state and crop depredation. For those of you from rural Georgia, uh, you will understand the issues that our farmers and farm families face every single day related to, to damage that feral hogs cause on land, they cause on crops. Uh, and so we're very pleased that the governor's, uh, in his recommendation, they uh, put $150,000 in our budget specifically for the Feral Hog Task Force and our work in partnership with DNR, USDA, and the conservation districts. Uh, that work is, is moving in the right direction. Uh, matter of fact, we are, we are getting ready to kick off the first pilot program that the task force is in, in charge of in the middle district, uh, in the middle conservation district that will start uh, in a couple of months. 
they're going to do a uh, the kickoff meeting here in a couple of weeks uh, for those farmers and who may be interested in partnering with us in that pilot program. So we're really excited about what we can do together as a team in addressing these issues related to crop depredation. Uh, I know deer has has been a big issue as well when it comes to crop depredation. That's not. Uh, that's something that we are continuing conversations on with members of the General Assembly, with Commissioner Rabin and the Department of Natural Resources and others. Uh, we're, we're definitely, that's definitely, you just cause this is called the Feral Hog Task Force. Uh, obviously, feral hogs are the focus, but we're, we're definitely have uh, issues related to crop depredation and deer damage across the state in mind as well. And we look forward to continuing those conversations of how we can work together to address that. We have some ideas, especially working with our hunter, hunter for the hungry program and others um, but it's definitely an issue that we need to continue to keep on the on the forefront um, uh, in relation to uh, the, the agricultural trust fund uh, every year there's a true up to that in the budget uh, so the the funds were put in it's for the true up to the Ag trust fund uh, the Ag trust fund is used for uh, funding uh, issues at the at the farmers markets as well as marketing and and communication for our agency. Um, you should have received a report from us uh, on those trust fund dollars. It is it is required that we submit that to uh, to the general assembly every year. Uh, we submitted that at the end of this past fiscal or this past year at the end of December. Um, and uh, we're really proud of the work that we've done at the farmers markets and addressing the issues and using that funding directly and in, 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 in a way that is targeted in those areas where it needs to be addressed to address the issues we have at our farmers markets across the state. Talking about the farmers markets and the bond package uh, that the governor uh, in the governor's budget, his recommendations, uh, there is funds for the Atlanta state farmers market specifically to the tune of $50 million. Uh, we are very appreciative of that investment, um, and, uh, and obviously this will allow us to shift our focus at the department when it relates to our farmers markets from merely just renovating our current facilities uh, to finding ways that we can have a long-term plan and addressing the issues that we have at the Atlanta State Farmers Market, uh, which are many. Um, and uh, obviously we would we would put this in a multi-phase project in a in a strategic plan and how we would move forward uh, and but we do have a lot of that already laid out uh, matter of fact we have at the agency we've been working on maintenance plans and what farmers market uh, what it would take to to upgrade our farmers market network specifically the Atlanta farmers market and if you look at it if we did a complete renovation top to bottom uh, everything at the Atlanta farmers market, we're looking at a little over 1.3 billion total in cost. So 50 million goes a long way. Uh, but in the grant, you know, when you think about the grand scheme of, of a, a, a real state of the art facility, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. Um, and so we appreciate this, this investment and look forward to continuing this conversation and how we can continue to invest in the produce capital of the Southeast and ensuring that we have those markets available for our farm families. And at the same time, ensuring that those on the market are buying and selling Georgia grown products from Georgia grown farmers and Georgia grown producers. I think that's important too, that we ensure that, that our Georgia farmers have access through that market to, to, to market their goods and their products around the state. And we look forward to, to that. Um, uh, conversation as well, but we're very appreciative. Uh, we also received a little over $1.7 million for vehicle replacement. Uh, currently in the department, we have a number of our inspectors that, uh, that actually are not in a state vehicle, which is a liability for us. Uh, and so not only that, uh, we, we give them mileage reimbursements, which gets very expensive. Uh, so our first priority will be ensuring that all of our team that deserve to be in a, in a state vehicle for the position that they hold uh, earn that slot. And that's what we'll be using this funding for and the reason we requested it. In addition to our high mileage vehicles, we have uh, over 65 vehicles that, are, that meet the state standard for replacement. Uh, so this is for 42 vehicles. Uh, and I'll talk about it in just a second, but, uh, but that gives you an idea of where we are as an agency. We have a lot of vehicles and we just need to continue to push and replacing those. In the FY25 bond package, um, the, the governor included our request of a million dollars for equipment at the lab in Tifton, uh, specifically to address the needs we have as an agency uh, to continue to, to uh, 
to, to move our mission forward and the, and the equipment upgrades that we need to ensure that our equipment's top tier and, and working, uh, working like it should. Uh, so we're very appreciative for that, uh, that them agreeing with that request, as well as $3 million for a new chiller and, and uh, a new generator, a million and a half a piece about. Uh, and so, uh, so that's going to go a long ways in ensuring that our lab in Tifton uh, can continue to operate as effectively and efficiently as possible. Uh, and we are very appreciative of that funding request uh, and that them agreeing with that funding request and putting it in the governor's budget. Um, I will speak real quick since I'm on the lab. I know uh, that the uh, the governor included in his budget of some funding for design of the ag building in which we're in uh, for renovation. Uh, on the sixth floor of our building is a lab. Uh, I just want to put it on your radar. I think we need to have a conversation uh, about that lab. So whenever we go to renovating that building, uh, if the General Assembly sees fit and moves forward with that funding request that's in the governor's budget, uh, I, you know, that, that lab, we will have to move that lab. We've been working with our other sister agencies across state government to try to find a place we could possibly put that either temporarily or permanently. So far, we haven't found any, any place for that to go. Uh, so there may be some honest conversation about possibly uh, needing some facility funding uh, to maybe build a lab in the future. Uh, for us to put our lab, uh, it's mainly our food safety lab. Uh, it's very important uh, to what we do. Uh, and so, and we believe it does belong in the, in the more metro region. Uh, I know we have our lab space in Tifton, but, uh, uh, and it's full uh, as well. But, uh, but I just wanted to put that on your radar as we continue these conversations about possible renovation, uh, that that's something that is top of mind for us. And we're already trying to find a place to put it. And so far, uh, no pun intended, but we've been striking out. So, um, and uh, so, uh, so we're, we're working to help, uh, help everybody, help us find a place to ensure that we're able to do it. Um, in request, uh, first off, I want to say we're very appreciative of Governor Kemp and his team uh, and Rick Dunn at OPB and, the, and our partnership and appreciate uh, the funding that they put in, in the governor's budget for our agency. It will help us. It will help us a lot. And it's going to help us move in the right direction as an agency. And we look forward to our continued work together. We do have some additional requests, obviously. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there, the bond package covers about 42 vehicles for us. We have about 70 that currently are, need replacing. Uh, so, uh, so that's obviously a continued need. I think a lot of state agencies deal with that every year, but continuing to ensure that we're addressing those vehicle needs. Uh, federal reimbursements, as I mentioned earlier, about 19% of our funding comes from the feds. So anytime we give a state pay raise, uh, to our employees. Um, we have to go to the federal government to get that reimbursement from them and hopefully get that added to our contract with them. Sometimes that takes up to 18 months for that to happen, uh, if, if not longer. Uh, but on average, about 18 months for us to get any response out of our federal partners. So whenever I have an employee that is 50% funded by the feds and 50% funded by the state, we only get 50% of their salary when we do a pay raise. So I have to find the funding in our budget internally to ensure that they get whole. Uh, so I just want to put that on your radar. Those are things we, we struggle with internally uh, on those federal reimbursements because those cycles lag. Uh, and, uh, and ensuring that we're able to, to cover those funds for our, our folks. I will say the $1,000 pay raise or the supplement that the governor put in the budget, they fully funded that even for our federal funded employees. So we are very appreciative that that is fully funded for both state and federal. So we're good uh, on that. As you all know, we passed the farmland conservation program last year, uh, the conservation fund program last year. Uh, this was a, a big initiative to ensure that we're protecting farmland in our state and creating that conservation easement program. Uh, I think we, uh, this is one of those things that, uh, that is, requires funding, obviously. Uh, so we, uh, we look forward to the conversation on what that will look like and how we can ensure that we're, we're funding that program to ensure we're protecting ag land in our state moving forward. Uh, as I mentioned in, 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 uh, in December, our emergency response uh, programs and what we do there this year, you know, we've responded to a lot. Hurricanes, seven 
tra uh, truck incidents where livestock or, or animals were involved on the interstate or highways across the state of Georgia, uh, the uh, different events across the state. We've dealt with uh, the freeze to our peach crop, uh, other, other responses that our agency is responsible for, uh, the yellow-legged hornet in Savannah, uh, all of those, um, the HPI event in Sumter County, uh, the avian influenza event, uh, all of those things uh, uh, are costly to, to our agency. And uh, we just appreciate the opportunity to have, an, have a conversation about emergency uh, response funding for, for us at the department. Um, and obviously, last, there's a lot of things we can talk about, but, uh, but as we continue working through the hemp program and what we have going on across the state related to the hemp industry and where we are, uh, we've been doing a lot of work internally on how we can best ensure that that program operates as efficiently, effectively as possible, but at the same time that the folks that are doing it right uh, are, are doing it right, and those that aren't uh, are addressed. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, we... Uh, we, we see some opportunity as an agency to address that issue. We're obviously, we've, we get calls constantly from our local partners, sheriffs and chiefs across the state, uh, wanting to partner with us on how we can work together. Uh, but we need to ensure we have the appropriate resources to be able to address that issue going forward. And we look forward to that conversation. I know I said last, one other thing that I didn't mention is uh, in regards to the agency, um, I, we submitted this, uh, I believe, to, to both budget offices, but uh, we've had some conversation internally about things that would make more sense in, as far as reorganization and, and where we are as a department, how certain entities operate within our agency. Uh, as you know, we have three buckets. We have administration, we have marketing, and we have consumer protection at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and there, we believe that some of those uh, programs that are in one sub-program may belong better in another sub-program. So, so um, we, uh, we definitely look forward to, to having that conversation to ensure that the, those budget line items line up with what is operationally appropriate for us at the agency and at the department. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to, to fill you in on where we are. And uh, I believe I left us uh, a, a little bit of time for questions. So I wondered if you were ever going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chairman, <laughs> Chairman Perkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for um, <laughs> for, for that um, uh, wonderful briefing you just gave us. So, uh, one of the things I want to make sure that we we do not do, uh, in in being good stewards, and that's the thing that we practice in uh, we practice what we preach here is being good stewards. Regarding the fifty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand um, dollar um, EV. Uh, charging testing stations. Um, if it was in code that you had to buy um, a loaf of bread the 5th and the 10th of every month and it happened to be during a hurricane and bread prices had gone from $3 a loaf to $15 a loaf, I would hope that we would have the foresight. I'm assuming that this is a temporary anomaly based on supply and demand because Ohm's law has not changed in the time that I've been in school. <laughs> and there has got to be a cheaper way to do it. Are we going to, as you know, through the mandate that we have with the Senate bill that was passed, um, is, is your feet to the fire to overpay for uh, a, a service that, that we need? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, I will say this. I think, uh, to your point, um, you are right. I, I think it is a concern. Uh, right now, currently, uh, we are only aware, I'm looking to my team to make sure I'm saying this correct, of one company that actually manufactures uh, testing equipment. Uh, so they're the only game in town, right? Uh, which gives them that flexibility uh, to, uh, to, to th that we're aware of as an agency. So if there's somebody out there that we're not aware of, we welcome that opportunity to have a conversation with them about what this looks like going forward. We've been having a lot of conversation internally about how we might could partner with some other entities uh, where we might could figure out how we could maybe design uh, some testing equipment that might not cost us as much. Obviously, if we do that, that would require um, some funding from the legislature as well to give us that opportunity to have those conversations with other entities, whether it's with our higher education institutions 
or otherwise uh, to where we could utilize um, their expertise. Uh, but currently, we are only aware of one entity that, that manufactures that equipment. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're, the law says we're to begin this program on January 1st of next year. That's what we're going to do. Uh, but uh, to your point, I think, uh, you know, as always, as being uh, fiscally conservative and ensuring that we're addressing um, it in the best way possible, it might be worth us exploring that a little bit further as we continue this conversation. Chairman Delazal. Thank you, Commissioner. It's, it's my understanding that we're one of the few states that are mandating this implementation starting in 2025. As you talk to your colleagues, I think a date that I've heard is that most other states are not doing this until 2028. Is that what you're hearing? So I, sure? I, to my understanding, and again, I don't want to speak without making sure I'm right. I believe we are the only state that is implementing this uh, in 2025. Uh, uh, most states are having that conversation around the 2028 timeframe, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and actually 2028 is when the, uh, the NIST uh, standards will be rolled out uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so our other counterparts around the country, we're having conversations with them, obviously, uh, and we're going to continue those conversations because we're trying to figure out what they may have been faced with. Have they found other other avenues to address this? Um, and so, uh, so we're committed to doing what we're asked to do. Uh, but to your point, uh, the 2028 timeline has been thrown around by some of our our partners around the nation. Commissioner, the more you talk, the more lights light up. <laughs> well, I was hoping so the longer get, I talk, get, the more time message, I eat up, you, Mr. Chairman. You understand, <laughs> Chairman Tokus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Harper, thank you very much for the great job you do, and I appreciate you personally coming down to Sumter County and addressing some of the issues. Uh, you mentioned briefly about the feral hog program and how deer has become an issue. Would you please elaborate a little bit on the deer problem, maybe to educate us and tell us what you're doing in that area? As, so, bri as briefly as, briefly as, as I can. <laughs> uh, so um, obviously crop depredation is an issue. You, you can talk to any of your counterparts, uh, Chairman Perkle, Chairman Watson, uh, um, um, Chairman Meeks, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Dickey. Uh, there, there are a lot of folks that can basically educate all of you a little bit deeper and in depth, but, uh, but deer crop depredation has been an issue, and we're working with DNR and Commissioner Rabin. We've already had uh, meetings. We're going to continue those conversations with the General Assembly and them on the best ways forward on how we can ensure that we're addressing that issue. One, so, so our hunters and, and, and our hunting community can continue to enjoy the sport, but at the same time, our farmers and farm families can, can, uh, can rest assured that they're, that they're not losing uh, millions of dollars overnight by, by crop depredation from, from deer damage to uh, agricultural crops. Chairman Beach. When he was in the Senate, he talked a lot also, so just want to <laughs> let you know that. Uh, I just got one quick question. Senate, we passed Senate Bill 132 prohibiting the Communist China government from buying our farmland here in Georgia. And one of the things, and I want to thank uh, Chairman Perkle for your work on that also. One of the things that we learned when we did the research, they're not buying small 20, 25 acre tracks, they're buying 1,000 acre tracks in California, North Dakota, Texas. Do you, we have an inventory or a database of who the farmers are that buy, that own 1,000 acre tracks here in our state of Georgia? Uh, I'm not aware that we have an inventory of those that own 1,000 acre tracks. Um, uh, but uh, to your point, it, it is a concern. Uh, foreign owned, especially uh, foreign owned land by the, our, our adversaries should be a concern. It's a national security issue. Uh, and I appreciate your work and Chairman Perkle's work on that issue and look forward to our continued work together to ensure that we protect Georgia farmland from those that want to do us harm. Well, we want to do everything we can to save the family farms. Thank yes, sir. You. Chairman Dickey. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And, and in, um, to keep us on time, I won't ask a question, but uh, just make a comment. Thank you for the great job you're doing promoting Georgia agriculture, Georgia's largest industry, and protecting our consumers. It's a big job. And just to the members of this committee, I think you recognize the big job and um, our Department of Ag has. And uh, I just want to commend the commissioner for tackling uh, so many different areas that really need um, attention. And I appreciate the 
the good funding to governor and, and hopefully this committee will, will uh, afford you to, to keep Georgia's um, agriculture and, and our consumers safe in this state. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Lady Houston. Two quick questions. Yes, ma'am. What is the mileage that you have when you require a new car? And um, my understanding is 175,000 is the DOAS uh, around that number is when it's supposed to be state surplus. Okay, how many cars do you have over 200? Uh, I can add it up real quick. No, that's okay. You I can get lot. it back to you. You have a lot of them over 200. I do have a number of them. I'm looking okay. at the list now. It's It goes almost the entire list uh, is 200. over 200,000 okay. miles. Right, yes, another quick question, another comment. Thank you for the job you're doing. And I know farmers and, and everybody's suffering from the deer population. And I think it would be interesting to see how much insurance premiums have gone up to take care of all the the deer damage that is done on Georgia highways. If you'll count the dead deer when you're riding up from from uh, around the, the state, yes, you'd be shocked until everybody's suffering too. Yes, ma'am. But farmers are suffering the most, but we're all paying for yes, it. Yes, ma'am. Senator Lucas. You got a question? Uh, it, uh, uh, Commissioner, when you said just make the deer season a little bit longer so you can... <laughs> <laughs> Pack more meat into your freezer. Hey, hey, to my good friend from Macon, I believe you know of what you speak. <laughs> We're going to close it out with the man from Liberty County, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, when you were calling the roll up there, I thought that only Republicans had a problem with hogs and I deer. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I... I don't have a lot of corn, but I got some flowers. <laughs> uh, Representative Chokas uh, asked a question that answered part of my question, but there's an ongoing fight with the feral hog. Is it measurable? Are you making any progress? Or are the hogs winning? <laughs> well, <laughs> to my good friend, Reverend Williams, uh, right now the hogs are winning. And, uh, <laughs> I was afraid of and, uh, and I know y'all, being a strong Georgia Bulldog like I am and many of you, we don't like it when the Razorbacks try to come to Georgia and win. <laughs> so we want to make sure we get them feral hogs taken care of. But we're, we're working on it. I really appreciate USDA coming to the table because them coming to the table is really going to help us put a, put a, a dent in this. Uh, so it is really a true partnership between the department, DNR, uh, Commissioner Rabin and his team, as well as USDA and, and their wildlife services uh, and, and our conservation districts, we really believe we can put a dent in it. Uh, but but we're but but uh, not doing anything is not the answer. Um, and so uh, we're working it working it as hard as we can. So thank, thank you, you, Reverend. Sir. Yes, sir. Commissioner, you got one more question if you got time for yes, it. Yes, sir. I do. Chairman Anderson. Thank you, Commissioner. For bringing that presentation. Um, could you give us an update on the uh, inspectors that we put in the budget for the soil amendment? Yes, sir, I sure can. So uh, the soil amendment program that y'all funded last year to the tune of about $550,000, um, some of that was equipment, some of that was personnel. Uh, all the personnel that was put in the budget have been filled except for one position, and that's in the South Georgia inspector position. Uh, we're still trying to find somebody to fill that role. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, recruitment has been difficult at the agency across the board. This would be one of those examples. Uh, so we have had, uh, we're working uh, day in and day out to get that position filled, but the position in North Georgia uh, has been filled. Uh, and so all the other positions that were funded have been filled as well. Have we had any cases yet? Uh, I know our team uh, continue to inspect complaints as they come in. Uh, and uh, I know in the last couple of weeks we've had a, a few of those trickle in and they've, they've went out and inspected those. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're continuing to work the ones that are brought to our attention. Uh, and those, those specific positions are specific to those, uh, those regions. They're the ones investigating those particular uh, complaints. Thank and we'll you. continue to do that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Harper. You survive. Well, th <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the committee. Thank you all very much. I look forward to our work together. Uh, and uh, good to see you all. You all have a wonderful day. Keep plowing.
Next up. Bon, Get out of here. Next up is report from Chairman Jason Shaw, the Public Service Commission. How you doing? Nah. Chairman Shaw, if you can get Commissioner Harper out, maybe we can get started. You know, I've waited for this opportunity for a long time. I, I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett and Chairman Tillery and members of the committee. It's good to be with you all today. I stepped out. We've got, uh, we began the hearings this morning on the integrated resource plan update to try to meet the growing needs of our state that uh, are attributed to the leadership of, of this General Assembly. Um, but as always, I thank you all for allowing us input into this budget process. The work that you all do ensuring Georgia remains physically sound as, as we perform the work of the people is a difficult, although essential, part of good governance. We are grateful to the governor for his proposed budget that includes much needed raises for PSC staff, as well as funds for new positions, equipment, and upgrades. These extra dollars will help to keep, keep the PSC competitive in the job market and accessible to Georgians. We've been busy at the PSC, as you may have read in the press. As of July 31, Plant Vogel Unit 3 is in commercial operation. It is providing carbon-free electricity to an estimated half million Georgia homes and businesses and will work day and night over the next 80 years or so. Later this quarter, Unit 4 is expected to go into operation as well. After many years, of hard work, the importance of these accomplishments cannot be understated. These are the first U.S. built nuclear reactors in over 30 years and as always Georgia is leading the way. The PSC expected long and contentious hearings to determine which construction cost would go to the ratepayers and which Georgia Power would absorb. Instead, through tough negotiation, concessions were made by Georgia Power. We came to a stipulation that saves Georgia ratepayers more than $3 billion in construction cost. And since the project began, the PSC has saved ratepayers $5.049 billion, and over the next 60 to 80 years, that will add up to savings of nearly $13 billion for Georgia's ratepayers. In a rare move, several consumer advocacy groups signed on to the stipulation as well. Um, it was a, just a fair and reasonable outcome to a very long and complex process. Over the past few budget cycles, the PSC has asked for additional personnel to replace employees lost in funding cuts. The new employees have significantly improved customer service and utility analysis. A full well-trained staff at the Commission correlates directly to lower energy costs for Georgians. The most recent ratepayer savings on Vogel are a testament to PSC staff positions funded by you all here. In this budget cycle, the PSC was asked to, to consider strategic enhancements that could move the needle on customer service. We asked for four new employees, two in our Call Before You Dig program, and two in our Pipeline Safety program. We also requested three new database updates and, update to our, and an update to our antiquated phone system. Um, the governor's proposed budget funded three of the new PSC employees and one of the database upgrades. These additions from the governor will help us to run more efficiently as we offer top-of-the-line service to Georgia residents and businesses, and they're very much appreciated. Respectfully, the PSC is asking the House and Senate to consider our other requests as well. The PSC requested two pipeline safety inspectors, and the governor funded one of those. So the additional pipeline safety inspector comes at a cost of $53,011 annual salary and a one-time $22,400 uh, amount for required equipment. Pipeline safety inspectors are responsible for ensuring natural gas pipeline operators in Georgia follow minimum federal safety regulations. Over the past 10 years, the turnover rate for our inspectors has been approximately 50%. <clears throat> 
Pipeline safety inspectors are state employees working under a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. The federal government partially reimburses Georgia for those program costs. Over the past several years, the DOT has increased re requirements for our pipeline inspectors and has reduced reimbursements for states not complying with these added requirements. So the PSC has worked diligently to comply, utilizing its current inspectors. Without new inspectors, Georgia's federal reimbursement race rate is at risk. We also asked for the three uh, database upgrades the governor did fund our call before you dig update. We're also asking for our new uh, consumer response system at a one-time $250,000 cost. One way that we serve the public is by helping resolve billing and service issues. When Georgians contact our consumer affairs unit, which happened 16,860 times, 68 times last year, a case file is created in a database. None of the utilities have access to that database currently. Any response from a utility must be emailed to a PSC representative and then manually entered into the information into the database. So a modern database would allow our representatives and utility representatives access to the same shared database and that would create an instant accounting of a case's progress from the minute a complaint is read by a utility representative through the resolution of the case Georgia consumers would be notified by email each time a representative from the commission or a utility company updates the case file with new information. The other database is a pipeline safety database, also at a one-time $250,000 cost. As stated, we receive a federal grant to partially reimburse cost of the pipeline safety program. The current pipeline safety database is approximately 25 years old it makes it difficult for our staff to comply with newer and more stringent federal reporting guidelines. That's also putting Georgia's reimbursement rate at risk. So a new database would contain information on all the gas operators in Georgia, currently standing at 190. The new database containing these inspections would be complex, searchable, and would contain multiple field capabilities. Um, the governor's proposed budget did not address our antiquated phone system I mentioned, that would be, that could be updated at a one-time cost of 100000 The PSC is long overdue for a modern phone system. The current phones were last upgraded more than 20 years ago. These antiquated phones do not allow for voice over internet protocol, the current industry standard. New phones would allow employees more efficiently in forwarding calls for remote use, would maintain call logs and have caller ID to provide a higher level of security. The current phones significantly hamper efficiency and adversely affect consumer service for Georgians. Finally, the Public Service Commission has a few housekeeping requests. We request a COLA shortfall for the FY24 budget cycle at a cost of $41,094 annualized. So the 24 budget included a $2,000 COLA for all full-time benefit eligible employees. The PSC has pipeline safety inspectors that perform federal work but are classified as full-time benefit eligible state employees. These employees were approved in the previous budgets to receive fully funded COLAs but were only partially funded in 24. So we're currently paying for these employees the full amount of the COLA and we request $41,094 to fully fund those increases that were not included in the budget. Also requesting an audit of our we need to perform an audit of our Universal Access Fund contributors, and we can do that. We would need to hire some outside help at a cost of $25,000. Georgia Code requires all telecommunications companies holding a certificate of authority issued by us to contribute to the Universal Access Fund that supplements funding for independent telephone companies across the state. An annual audit will ensure revenues in the fund are accurate and contribution factors are applied correctly. Also, we're requesting funding to ensure business continuity in the amount of $61,046. We have four units under our utilities regulation division. Each unit has a director. To ensure continuity and to cross-train leadership duties, the PSC is asking for funds to promote four employees into a deputy director position. So we've got our telecom, our gas, our electric and our renewables uh, and energy uh, efficiency are, are our four units. <clears throat> the total request of these before the governor's recommendations for amended fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 comes to $802,551. This concludes our request. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. You think you can teach Commissioner Harper how to talk that fast? <laughs> He usually talks faster than me. I'm just trying to get back to work over there. Chairman Huffstetler. 
Thank you for being here, Commissioner. Yes, sir. And I know um, you guys are talking capacity hearings, and I was looking at the uh, the Vogel on the EIA, you know, the federal website that shows all those things, and you've got about a 7.5% increase in capacity for Georgia Power from that, but I saw it was a 47% increase in capital basis, which is what people pay it on. But also on there, I noticed that in 2007 and 8, Georgia Power sold more power than they did in 22 and um, looked like they had double the excess capacity of the national average. So with the staff, I'm not going to ask you something that you got to say ex parte on. With the staffing that has been given to you, do you think you've got adequate staff to review this capacity request and do you plan on following their recommendations? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, I do, but we do have to seek the source from outside consultants to help us dig into these cases, um, particularly the Vogel case. Uh, you all helped us with uh, additional staff there. We brought in, um, and I, I think some of these ex experts that we brought in and the work that they did under, on, the, on the beginning stages of the negotiations really helped us in those negotiations to reach that stipulation. Um, but at the end of the day, you're exactly right. But uh, what we're dealing with now currently is truly unprecedented, just like the generational growth that, that our state has seen over the last, you know, really starting in 22. Um, we had an IRP in 22 that we voted on. Uh, we started hearings in January and we voted on that in July. But since then, the load forecast and the growth that we're seeing is truly unprecedented. So that's the challenge that we've got uh, as well as all of the other, um, you know, the, the EMCs, Oglethorpe and the Munis, everybody's faced with this same challenge. Georgia's the place to be, the place to want to work and move your companies and your families, but we're, we're having to keep up with that demand. Vogel has played a key role in where we are today and one of the reasons why Georgia is and has that kind of level of capacity that many other states don't have. And we're still, we still have competitive rates. We've gone through very tough challenges with increases just like everybody has, but our level of increases is, is very modest in comparison to what other states are seeing, and that's why I think we're still probably just as competitive, if not more competitive today than we have been. Chairman Dickey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Chairman Shaw, uh, we got some of the coldest weather coming later this week. Can you assure this committee that we have the capacity and the grid, no, grid network to handle that? Well, that's the question we've been asking, Mr. Chairman. That is the question of the day for sure. Um, this is a significant weather event. I don't know that it's going to reach the severity, hopefully not, of uh, Winter Storm Elliot, the Christmas storm year before last. Uh, I'm going to just tip my hat to our utilities in this state. All of the utilities around us in Winter Storm Elliot had rolling back blackouts. That's TVA, Duke Carolinas, Florida Power and Light, and we didn't. But I will, I will be the first to tell you that one of the reasons we had less industrial load on the day of that storm because it was Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But so did they. But we performed well. I think that's why it's important what we're doing over there across the street today is making sure we can meet these needs. I think the biggest thing that, that you'll, will, you may hear about is starting last Friday, our gas operators did send memos out to all of their commercial interruptible customers, letting, know, letting them know ahead of time that we do have a significant event coming and that there would be a chance to have to curtail those customers. But they, they understand that. They pay a lower rate uh, as, a, as a result. But that is a very strong possibility. But I do have, I feel very, very strongly that we're going to be able to meet the needs um, of our state through this weather event, and it's going to last several days. Uh, Chairman Shaw, I have a question or more of a statement. One of the things I know we've talked a little bit offline about this that I'm hearing more and more from members is about uh, gas capacity. It used to be broadband, mm -hmm. and honestly, you, the uh, members of this room, and the governor have done such a good job of tackling the broadband issue that we don't really hear as much about it anymore. Gas has quickly become uh, that hot top burner issue, no pun intended. The um, thing I'd ask the commission to do, if you have ideas on ways we can do that, we tried to be creative last year and set up a fund potentially in GFA. Our understanding is the cost per linear foot is a lot higher from one of the utilities than it has been from the others. It's because of cost involved. We understand that they're, they're set up differently. 
But if that different setup means we should st structure the way we fund things differently, uh, we're, we're open to hear those conversations. Um, without additional gas capacity, I'm afraid that we're going to be our own worst enemy as, as far as industrial development and even commercial development go. Yeah, Chairman Tillery, that's a great question, and obviously that's something that you and I have had extensive conversations about, many of you in the room. It's a, sh a concern that I share, particularly as a rural Georgian that's passionate about the economic development that's going on because of y'all's leadership. Uh, but yeah, we are. We're running into capacity constraints. We're faced with federal regulations that are making it more expensive and more difficult to, to install that infrastructure. But the biggest drawback is just the cost. It's a money thing. Um, you know, as a regulator, we have to be careful and we're not going to allow our, our gas operators to go out there and build pipelines to nowhere, so to speak. Um, you know, it's not fair to the, the other rate payers to spend a lot of money for, for one customer or two customers. So that's where these programs like our Universal Service Fund comes into play. And I know y'all had, uh, we had worked on this audit for y'all. I've got a copy of that, but I, I know that y'all have seen that. But it really goes into detail on how that fund works. It's capped at 25 million now. We also have our Econ 1 tariff, which if a project meets a certain threshold in terms of economic impact, then we can allow, in this case, Atlanta Gas Light, the investor-owned operator that we regulate, to, to seek recovery. But, but those funds are just not near enough to meet the demand that's really out there that we see. If I, I'd say at any given point, just the amount of projects that we know of out there in the state that need gas infrastructure that don't have the funds to get it. I'm going to use Brantley County as an example. Y'all heard me talk about Brantley County. That's down in southeast Georgia, very real close to the ports, right in the heart of this wood pellet um, territory where those pellets are going out of the Brunswick port. I mean, it's 30 miles away from that port. They have zero natural gas in that entire county. When I took office on the PSC January the 3rd of 2019, we started working on Brantley. And at that point, it was roughly $25 million to bring gas to that site that we were looking at there. Well, now that, that cost has, has probably doubled, more than doubled. Just that we've seen that kind of cost increases in that period of time. But that doesn't mean we're not committed to try to do something. We're going to need y'all's help. I don't know whether that's a state appropriation or what. The Universal Service Fund is another tool, but we're going to have to figure out how to beef that up some as well. But I'm here and ready to help and work with you. We would love to have a seat at the table. Um, it is a challenge, and it's just going to get bigger, um, particularly that area, the state where you're in, the growth in the Savannah area. That's one of the areas where um, we're seeing the biggest need. All right, last question is from Chair Lady Houston. understand that your phones don't have call ID no ma'am our phones are if if I would brought one to you you'd laugh at it it's okay. like the ones we replaced at our office about 20 years ago all right then the, I really think you need call ID so you'll know who you need to talk to but anyway well, the next thing is on your universal access fund you said it was to fund independent phone companies the Universal Access Fund is, is a very dwindling source of revenue because it's funded off landline telephones. Landline, and well, and I would think there'd be fewer independent telephone yes. companies to fund. That, that fund is actually phasing out over time. I well, don't good. remember exactly. There's, there was two parts to the fund, and one, one part of that just phased out in the last couple of years, and the other part will be when phasing out. When you say out. phased out, I haven't noticed it's gone right off of my phone bill on my landline phone. But the, the, the part of the funding that was allocated to certain resources has been phased out. The, the part now is the part that's left that where all of the independent telephone companies come in and put their proposals together and based on a, a formula of customer served and so forth, that's where that money. And I'll be honest, that money has been has benefited rural Georgians in a big way over the time because when we started looking at broadband, if you noticed, if you looked at those maps, many of those counties that were served by an independent telephone op operator that had access to those UF, UAF funds for years already had internet. Brantley County is a prime example. Brantley County wow. had good internet service, but they just don't have gas. The plant telephone in Tifton did too, I think. That's right. I don't think it's called that anymore. They did Thank change you. names, that's right. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, Chairman Shaw, and we'll let you go back to work. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Next up is Director Tim Lowmore from the Georgia Forestry Commission.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. You got the floor. All right. Great. I did not put together slides for, for this group, and it reminded me a long time ago when I heard a presentation be given that said that um, folks that put slides up sometimes may need help on what they need to talk about. So I'll leave, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I did say it. <laughs> no, good afternoon, you, you just uh, Mr. Chairman, copies, right? Tillery, uh, <laughs> Chairman, <laughs> Chairman uh, Hatchett. Uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to be here today, and um, it is a, is a wonderful opportunity to, to get to share with you and to talk about uh, the positive impact that our agency is having on our state, uh, and then also to talk about the governor's proposed budget, uh, his items in that budget, and then how we believe those will build on our successes. So uh, what a great honor it is to be here. I do have Michelle Gray with me uh, in the back of the room, our CFO. Uh, I also have uh, someone I'd like to introduce to this body, Johnny Sabo, uh, in the back of the room. He's our deputy director at the Georgia Forestry Commission, and we were able to recruit him away from Florida uh, Forestry Service. He had 20 years of experience there. Um, Johnny is a forester by trade. He has the highest qualifications when it comes to a complex incident manager uh, that's available in the wildfire fighting community. Uh, and I am excited to have him on my team and on our team here in Georgia. And he's hit the ground running and has the great respect of our state uh, and our agency, and he's doing great things. Uh, thank you for, for the work that both of those individuals do, and, and matter of fact, for all of our employees that work hard for our agency every day. Our mission uh, here at the Forestry Commission is to protect Georgia's forest, uh, to promote them to be healthy, sustainable forest, uh, and then also to promote the goods and services that come from those. Um, I've been in this role now for a short, quick three years, and I was reminded this past summer of really what our mission is. And, and I wish everyone in this room had that opportunity, uh, the same opportunity that I did. I was out on a property in Harris County, Georgia, with Mr. Hal Avery. And Mr. Hal toured me around his tree farm, and he talked about the effort, the energy, uh, the resources, the time uh, that he puts into his tree farm, planting trees, managing those trees, growing those trees. He talked about the risk about wildfire and insects and disease and how impactful those types of disasters could be to his farm and to his family. And it just reminded me, as I was putting together these remarks for today, it just, I thought back to that experience, and it just reminded me that there's tens of thousands of Hal Avery's in this state. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of forest landowners in this state that some know they depend on us and some may not know they depend on us as a state agency as their frontline defense against wildfire and forest health issues. And um, I'm really uh, just taken back. Uh, and again, I wish that everyone in this room could have that opportunity and just really see how important the work that our agency does for forest landowners all across our state, uh, like Mr. Avery. Our top threat as an agency to our success continues to be recruiting and retaining skilled workforce at the ground level to be able to fulfill that mission. Fortunately, we're making success in that way, and largely in part because of what this body and what the governor, the investments that you have made into our agency, and we'll talk about some of those as we go forward, and I believe we're heading in the right direction uh, to continue on those and those successes. I said I've been here for about three years now. I came in from the private sector. Uh, I've getting my feet underneath me uh, in, in government, uh, in the government arena, in the government sector. Uh, in those three years, I've had the opportunity to visit with some of my peers just to get some best management practices and learn from my peers in other states. And what I walked away from some, from some of those learnings is that I truly believe that we have one of the best forestry agencies in the nation. Uh, and I am committed to continuing to ensure that we remain that way. I do want to update you on two ideas or two things that we've talked about in the past. And one of those is stabilizing our workforce. That's been a top priority for me since I've been here and a top priority for many of you. Uh, and thank you for the support. How do we know we're getting it? And how do we know it's working? Turnover and uh, recruitment and retention is one measure. Fiscal year 22, our turnover rate was 27% with our wildland firefighters, and it was um, 
18% with our foresters. Respectively, the first six months of FY24, our uh, turnover rate is in the single digits. For wildland firefighters, we're at 8%, and for foresters, we're at 3%. Again, I believe we're making some progress. What have we done to accomplish that? We've expanded and created a more robust career ladder for our employees. We, uh, with this group, uh, when your support for COLA uh, raises over the last couple years, we've moved the starting salary from when I got here for wildland firefighters and foresters respectfully from 30,000 for a wildland firefighter and 38 for a forester to 41 and 50 respectively. We think that's making a big difference. We've managed our cash flow in a way that's allowed us to pay our employees when they go on Western assignments in a more efficient way. When I joined the agency, it sometimes was taking 12 months to pay an employee that went on a Western assignment. 95% of our employees are being paid in the next paycheck um, uh, currently. We've used technology to automate reports for our employees. And then lastly, we've got a present and responsive leadership team. I think that's key to employee retention and recruitment. Um, we made a strategic decision about 12 months ago, and we onboarded a new HR director as well, Connie Spruill, uh, who had been with the uh, Department of Corrections. She has come on board and just been a really welcome boost of energy uh, to all of our HR efforts. You know, and I talk about recruitment. Um, I regularly get phone calls now from some of you in this room, from private landowners, um, asking about vacancies that we have and giving recommendations for young men and young women in their communities that want to come to work for us. That was unheard of just 36 months ago. Um, I want to update you on a couple big uh, departments our agency uh, has, the work that they do, and then we'll walk right into the budget uh, proposals that the governor had uh, put forth for, for on behalf of our agency. Unfortunately and sadly, um, our Forest Protection Department, which is the largest uh, in our agency, uh, unfortunately and very sadly this year, we had to deal with a, um, a fatality. Uh, of an employee, uh, Mr. Luke Daniels, in Washington County. He was on the job. Uh, he was out doing what we call mop-up work uh, after and measuring the fire the next day. It was about a 10-acre wildfire in Washington County. Had a cardiac ex episode uh, and, and never, never was able to be revived, even though our employees uh, rendered CPR there on the site. Really just a reminder of the work that our employees do. Uh, and the risk and that the fact that they uh, are in dangerous conditions and it is a hazardous job. Um, so I know many of you and some of you in this room reached out to me directly. Uh, those reach outs were greatly appreciated and they were heartfelt and our entire agency appreciated that. And thank you for supporting uh, our agency during that really terrible time. Um, this, and then in fiscal year 23, I would just say our, our forest uh, Protection Department serviced over right at 6,000 landowners uh, with prescribed, um, prescribed burning services, with pre-suppression pre fire breaks, uh, and then many other services that we provide. And I'm really proud of the work that our employees are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And considering that that happens in a very narrow window of time, it's usually November to um, right after leaf fall to early spring, so we do a lot of work in a very short period of time. We had over 2,500 fires, wildfires, that burned about 11,000 acres in our state that we responded to as well. Uh, I talked a minute ago about Western fire assignments. One thing that we do is support our wildland firefighters. When we're down and have slow periods here, usually in the summer periods, we promote and encourage our firefighters to go out west and help our states across the country when they need support and help. It allows them to earn some extra income. The real advantage for us as a state is that they go get experience. They bring that experience back to us and use it in their local communities when it comes to wildfire response uh, and wildfire control. We sent over 208 firefighters out last year. Uh, 77 of those went to Louisiana. Oftentimes I get asked, how come we don't have fires here in the U.S. South? Let me tell you, Louisiana back in the late summer was burning up. 
I had the opportunity to go visit those fires to get a learning, take a learning experience to see what, what it was like. 30,000 acres on one private landowner burned up. Uh, that landowner was very dependent on that forestry commission and forestry service in Louisiana. Um, it looked just like, I heard PSC commissioner talking about Brantley County. It looked just like Brantley County, but it was on fire. Uh, we do and we are susceptible to wildfires here in our, in our state. I want to talk about our forest management department. Those are our professional foresters that give forest health and forest uh, management advice. Um, they visited over, over 8,300 landowners last year and looked at over 550,000 acres on the ground, providing written management advice, forest health advice, cost share incentives, payments, and management plans to landowners. Really, really proud of the work our professional foresters do. We have an excellent group of uh, professional foresters across our state ready to serve and I know from experience many of you and several of you uh, in this room have dealt with our foresters and I know that you share your appreciation for the work that they do on a daily basis for uh, our state. I'll turn to our budget. Um, I'll just say right out of the gate um, the AFY24 and FY25 proposal that the governor has put forth to our agency and for our agency is a historic investment. And that's not lost upon us as an agency. Um, we are extremely appreciative of the investment uh, that the governor and his team um, are proposing for the Georgia Forestry Commission. Uh, we believe that as an agency, we are strong fiscal stewards. We'll continue to be strong fiscal stewards and use these uh, resources uh, wisely and can, so that we can fulfill the mission of our agency and really uh, continue to focus on protecting uh, private forest lands all across our state. His recommendations um, include investing in our employees, safety by improving our communications, uh, fiscal responsibility by reducing future liabilities, modernizing, modernizing our fleet, our tractors and our equipment, and then recapitalizing our state nursery that supplies seedlings to landowners all around our state. AFY24, uh, I heard Commissioner Harper say this about the $1,000 bonus or supplement, excuse me, that's a reversion back to my private sector days. It's a, it's a, it's a supplement, not a bonus, um, that, was, that was dispersed in $1,000 uh, to all state employees in December. Greatly appreciated, that is included, that money's already been spent. Uh, it is included in AFY24. Um, we, we are thankful for that and appreciative of that and thankful for your support. Uh, under the Protection Department, there is an $8.6 million um, uh, proposal for equipment and installation for equipment uh, associated with the new statewide public safety radio network to achieve statewide inter interoperability. We are a first responding agency. We are there right beside GEMA, DNR, Georgia State Patrol, DOT, uh, when there are natural disasters. And this radio communication would align us with what they already have in place so we can communicate with them efficiently when we're responding. It will also modernize our communication systems and remove us off of the VHF, VHF to a VHF and LTE technology, um, which is a simpler, more um, more forward-looking communication platform that we're excited about. It reduces our future liability and how it does that is VHF requires towers. We own and manage about 77 towers. This will allow us to not have to replace all of those towers once they need to be replaced going forward at the tune of about $275,000 each. Um, under Tree Seedling Nursery, there's a $621,000 uh, ask there for a proposal there to recapitalize, recapitalize our nursery operation. And that really is to transition our nursery from a bare root nursery into a containerized nursery uh, operation, which is what the marketplace, uh, for those of you that buy tree seedlings, that's where the marketplace is at. That's where the marketplace is going. That will supplement a federal grant uh, that we're receiving $160,000 a year for five years. So um, really look forward and, um, and ask for your support for that. A one-time item underneath, um, I guess that would be what we would always in the past call bond 
funds, but it's cash funds that's moved over to GSFIC, and that's for additional funding for our Bacon Pierce County unit uh, there on the Bacon Pierce County line, and those are with additional costs associated with rising construction uh, prices and construction costs. I'll shift to FY25. Um, we certainly, uh, the governor's proposing a 4% COLA for employees, uh, and then he's also including a $3,000 enhancement for our law enforcement officers that we have on staff. We uh, are greatly appreciative of that. That's a $1.6 million across all departments to our agency. Under protection in FY25, there's $2.3 million for funds for equipment in the protection operating budget. For me, that's a big deal, uh, and I ask for your support for that. Uh, that allows us to be able to start getting in a tune to where we can build a replacement schedule because we'll have those funds in our operating budget versus having to ask for bond money and uh, having bond allocations on, a, on an annual basis. will allow put us in a better seat uh, for planning purposes for environmental cabs, which we still have 100 op open cab tractors, uh, and we need to replace those hundreds and put our workforce in cabs where they're protected from smoke, dust, inhalation, and allow them to uh, be able to do their job and be fresh on their job. And there's also under protection a $300,000 ask for ongoing services contracts for the new statewide public safety network uh, that is uh, funded or asked for in the um, AF424. Um, cash funds or bond funds for a, uh, fiscal year 25, a new office construction in our McDuffie office. Um, I have visited that office. It is in much, it's in much need of repair or replacement. Uh, One million, a little over a million dollars for MMR funds uh, that will allow us to do some high priority maintenance uh, across our um, uh, offices around the state. And then $1.1 million for vehicle funding for light vehicles. I would just close up with saying that, you know, the past three quick years have, three years have moved extremely quickly. Um, I will, I know they probably have for you, but I know they have for me. Um, I am extremely proud of the agency that I get to go to work for every day. I'm thankful for the work that our people get up and go to work for and do every day. It's honorable work. It's good work. They do a good job. I'm proud of the support that you've given us as a body here. I'm proud of the support that the governor continues to give us and to demonstrate through this proposed budget. I think that it will make a, help us build on our success uh, for where we're at, and I look forward to uh, how this historic investment will uh, continue to, to make the Georgia Forestry Commission and keep the Georgia Forestry Commission one of the premier forestry agencies in the nation, and that's my commitment, and um, I'm convinced that we can do that uh, and do that through this wise investment that has been sent our way. So thank you for the opportunity to present. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Director Lamar. You have a couple. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, sir. I was listening. Your turnover rates certainly speaks well for your department. Excellent, and certainly the pay raises were well needed. Uh, I want to ask, you implemented a program where you moved some personnel, and I'm specifically talking about a location in Midway, which happens to be very dear to me. You took the personnel, but you left the equipment where I think I understand that you will send people in. And the, the, the personnel and that location, I'm a very young man, but it's been there all of my life. And I was wondering, with the intended results, were you able to attain them? Has it been successful? Or are you gonna send my people back? No, that's a very good question. That hasn't been done yet. That's proposed, that's our Liberty Long right. Office combination. Uh, we are in the beginning, well not beginning, we've already got the plan and the property acquired, but we haven't developed the construction yet. But the idea there is to get more individuals and more equipment under one roof for the supervisors to, to be able to supervise his team in a more efficient uh, and a more um, allocate resources in a little bit more efficient way. Um, 
so the, the equipment has not been moved, the personnel have not been moved, but the plan is to do that, Representative Williams. Uh, I'm convinced that there will, you know, during higher fire danger days, uh, we do this already uh, in, because our Georgia, some of our counties are large. So when there's high fire, high fire danger days in our state, we will pre-position equipment around counties at fire stations or at different locations that we may own or have access to. We'll do that in that particular situation. I think having our individuals under one roof uh, and having them underneath the supervisor and having all the equipment there in one location, a modern location, uh, is, is, is an appropriate way to go. Great question. Senator Sims, do you have a question? Did you? Okay. It seemed like your light was up earlier, I think. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Executive Director Shanzia Thomas of the Georgia Technology Authority. They have a lot of money going through the Technology Authority, so Let's see what she got, huh? All right. The floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Sean Zia Thomas. I am honored to serve as your state CIO and the Executive Director for the Georgia Technology Authority. I want to thank you for allowing me and my team members to come here and tell you about all the great work that we're doing at GTA. At GTA, we provide IT and cybersecurity leadership and services for efficient government to best serve Georgians. Is it, is it up? It's not working. Okay. Battery died. Okay, I'll do it here. Okay. That includes establishing IT policy, standards and guidelines, which we call PSGs, security consulting, security plan review, security operations and monitoring, and security incident response support. We also deliver IT infrastructure services for approximately 89 executive branch agencies and manage network services for more than 1,200 state and local government entities. We also manage the state's official website, georgia.gov, which hosts about 70 agencies' websites, and the leading Georgia broadband program along with DCA to promote broadband services deployment in unserved areas of the state. Additionally, GTA published an initial policies and standards to guide the use of artificial intelligence in state government. Throughout the governor's budget document, you'll see FY25, an adjustment in telecommunications and infrastructure rates for the Georgia Technology Authority. Adjustments to FY25 budget programs are reflected, reflective of the rates adjustment for telecommunication and infrastructure services provided through GTA. It has been eight years since the state made a rate adjustment for these services. In 2020, GTA lowered the administration fee to help reduce the cost to state and its customers. The FY25 service rates for telecommunication and infrastructure services accounts for the increase and in changes of costs for technology services provided currently. On 
On page 93 of the Governor's Budget Report for FY24, amended FY24, you will see a payment to GTA's Technology Empowerment Fund, which we refer to as TEF, for five projects totaling over $158 million. Oversight provided through the Technology Empowerment Fund helps to ensure that critical IT projects are completed on time and on budget. GTA provides agencies with technical oversight and expertise to help ensure the success of these projects. This fund has a steering committee that meets quarterly to go over uh, the funds in this project, and it is comprised of myself, Chairman Hatchett and Chairman Tillery, the House and Senate Budget Directors, Christine Murdoch and Brent Churchwell, OPB's Director Rick Dunn, and the State Auditor Greg Griffin. I'd like to give you a quick overview of the five projects that I know the agency, but I know the agencies will offer more details in their presentations later. The projects covered in this $158 million, the first project is the State Accounting Office modernization for the next-gen ERP system. This is additional funding for an ongoing TEF project. It provides funding for a cloud-based software solution to replace the PeopleSoft teamwork system that was installed in Georgia over 20 years ago. The, sec this, uh, the ERP project, the implementation will probably take between four to five years. The second project, the, the Department of Labor Unemployment Insurance System, DOL is seeking to modernize their unemployment insurance system, a system that has been put in place and used since 1986. G DOL will also receive federal funding to go along with this funding. And this project's timeline is about 27 months. The third project is the Georgia Professional Standards Commission's Education Certification Case Management System. This is, an, this is additional funding for an ongoing TEF project. PSC is replacing their 25-year-old legacy system. It includes two applications used for managing credentials and ethic requirements. The fourth project is the Board of Regents ERP system. The current, the current legacy ERP system for the University System of Georgia was developed more than 20 years ago. That system is older than some of the students there. This is an effort to make appropriate investments in the technical infrastructure required for their students, faculty, and staff to function effectively during a modern mobile user environment. And that last project, that's in that 158 million, Department of Human Services, STARS Case Management System, and that's their child support system. And this project is a five-year project also with federal funding, and it is, it is to replace a 29-year-old system. So this funding is, is, is needed because these systems are old systems. On this slide, you'll see the General Assembly provided funding for three of these projects, two that I had already mentioned, and here's a brief update on those. The next-gen ERP system has over 330 state staff involved in a workday ERP implementation with Deloitte. GTA participates, participated in the RFP development and provides oversight in all as aspects of this implementation. The All Pairs Claim Database, APCD, it provides, it's, it's APCD data provides to OCI for surprise billing. There's 10 use cases expected to be, um, uh, that, that will come up in the next 60 days. And again, GTA provides oversight and subject matter expertise in this project. 
The teacher certification, RFP, is expected to be released within the next 60 days, and GTA is leading the efforts in developing that RFP. So we're heavily involved in all of these projects that we're overseeing. So now, in the next slide, I want to bring up my CISO to talk about our cybersecurity efforts. Steve Hodges. Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon. I want to begin with some sobering statistics. We're seeing an increased frequency and severity of cyber attacks worldwide. There's been a 42% global increase in cyber attacks in 2022 as compared with 2021. The numbers are not in for 2023 yet, but we should expect increasing frequency and severity of attacks. We're seeing the total cost of a breach also increase worldwide. The total financial loss worldwide from cybercrime in 2022 was $10.2 billion up from 6.9 billion in 2021. The average cost of a data breach has reached an all-time high this year of 4.45 million per incident, according to IBM's 2023 cost of a data breach report. The same report stated that 51% of organizations are planning to increase security efforts and security spending in response to these breaches. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. So what are we doing? Well, at GTA, we've stood up a security operations center for the state. We're logging and acting on security events that are coming in from agencies. We're helping agencies with vulnerability management and scanning of their systems. And we've rolled out an endpoint detection and response system to a variety of agencies that have elected to participate with us in that effort. As Sean has already mentioned, we have PSGs, policy standards and guidelines that we write for information security that help direct agencies in how to keep their systems and data secure. We're performing security program assessments where we're bringing in third parties that we've pre-qualified to review agency security programs. We're assisting agencies with audit preparation and with security programs, helping them write their security programs and their own policies. On page 95 of the Governor's Budget Report, you'll see a $15 million expenditure or request in fiscal 25 to enhance and standardize cybersecurity services for executive branch agencies. The state wants to continue to invest in the security of state assets. What do we want to do? These programs that I've just spoken about are rolled out to a subset of agencies. Some of those items are present in more executive branch agencies than others. This budget request will allow us to extend these services to all of the executive branch agencies. And that's what we want to try to do, is bring all the executive branch agencies up to the same level of security, give them the same tools, give them the same support. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now for our last slide, I'm going to bring up Jessica Simmons, and she's our broadband director, and she's going to talk about all the great things that GTA and DCA has been doing on broadband. Thank you very much. I just wanted to quickly have the opportunity to give you an update of where we stand with the um, broadband program that the Georgia Technology Authority is assisting uh, OPB with. Um, obviously, back in 2022, um, Governor Kemp allocated $414 million in state fiscal recovery funds um, for broadband expansion throughout the state. Um, last year, he awarded an additional $246 million in capital projects fund funding, which was also a subset of funding for connectivity within ARPA um, and so combined um, with those two programs we currently have roughly about 660 million dollars in flight coupled with the matching funds associated with those programs um, currently it's roughly about 1.2 billion that's currently being built because of these programs um, and all of those locations have to be built by the end of 2026 
I think the really important thing that we wanted to highlight today, though, is um, based on our update from last year, one of the things that we worked um, very hard on was to um, get Treasury to update some of their um, procurement guidance so that it was much easier for the companies that were actually building with these programs. And so we're very pleased um, that the money is flowing out of OPB much faster now because Treasury did make those adjustments. And so now, as of last week, um, roughly $163 million has been dispersed um, by OPB out of that $660 million for broadband. Um, the other thing that we wanted to highlight as well is um, back in 2021, um, we had roughly, based on our state mapping effort, um, about 482,000 unserved locations. Um, fast forward to the end of 2023 with the grant programs that we have implemented, and we're currently standing at roughly about 120,000 um, remaining unserved locations in the state of Georgia that don't have a funding commitment for better service. Um, and that's where, obviously, um, our, our next program comes in, um, where it was announced in June of last year um, that the state is going to be receiving an additional $1.3 billion um, in broadband equity access and deployment funding within the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and so with that program, we will work this year to allocate that funding to get to all of the remaining unserved, unfunded locations throughout the state. And then also additionally to that, we'll be receiving um, additional funding that we will deploy a grant program for later next year um, for a digital equity capacity grant um, to um, help facilitate um, digital literacy and um, subscription, and that will be through local governments and nonprofits. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Executive Director Thomas. Thank you, Jessica. So that includes our, our presentation of GTA's overview, our cybersecurity program, our uh, broadband program. So we open the floor for questions. Just a little bit of money, right? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Representative Heagley. Lucas's. <laughs> go ahead. We'll re we'll repeat it for you. So go ahead and ask it, and we'll repeat it. to answer your first part of your question, it's not just GTA. We have the state agencies and their IT teams and their procurement teams and their staff. We also have the vendors. So with the vendors, the state agencies, and GTA, I am very confident that we can manage all these projects. And as far as, you know, making sure we don't um, talk about these systems 30 years from now, we just need to make sure that we're, we're, we're constantly upgrading as we go along. Representative Stoner. Are you dead too? Before you, before you answer, I'm going to repeat his question just so the folks who are listening. Uh, Representative Stoner asked, basically, could you give us the definition of served? He saw your 420, 480 go down to 120. Could you tell us what served means now by the federal rules? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, so the, the definition um, of 
served at this point based on these federal programs is going to be locations that are at 100 by 20 so 100 megabits in the download and 20 in the upload um, at this point though um, we do still have a remaining 120,000 locations within the state that are below 25 by 3 so at this point, as we're looking forward to our next program, we really are looking at three categories of locations. The unserved locations, which are, are truly unserved locations that don't even have 25 by three. Then we're looking at the delta of the locations that can hit 25 by three but can't do 100 by 20 as the underserved category, and then anything above 100 by 20 will be served. And I'm just saying, you might want to explain what you mean by those Sure. So again, 25 megabits in the download and three in the upload is kind of the, the base standard at this point that's still in state law is the definition of served, but all of the federal programs have really kind of moved the de facto line of service up to 100 by 20, um, really to have the kind of capacity that you would need to you know, run multiple devices in a home, um, you know, multiple people working, um, students working along with you know, someone teleworking, you know, again, lots of devices pulling on that connectivity. Um, the 100 by 20 threshold is obviously you know, a, a much better point to get locations to in Georgia so that, again, multiple devices can be running um, and not experience any um, issues within a home. So um, we, are, we are seeing that you know, we've made a really big um, jump based on the, the number of locations that still don't have funding commitments. Um, but obviously, we still do have a lot of locations that are in flight that are still being built. Um, but then, obviously, we feel like the um, bead funding that we're receiving this year will be sufficient to get to the remaining locations. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I guess I got the last comment. Uh, first of all, Director Thomas, uh, Jessica, and Steve, I want to praise you for y'all have done an immaculate job with a lot of different projects from various scopes and, and from whether it be the All Pair Claims Database to give us a better idea of where state funds are going and the impact that we're making. We increase a fee. We don't know if it's really making the impact we think. You guys have helped us there. The deployment of broadband, I think, will be the legacy of this legislature. Um, what you have, because of you, we've been able to accomplish. You and Jen Wade, I think, single-handedly did it. Jessica, mm -hmm. for those yeah. of you who don't know, literally Jessica and Jen Wade were changing, helping make recommendations that the feds took on. Uh, right. due to uh, broadband so it was incredibly impressive and Sean Zia to head it all up now what we're trying to do with Workday yes moving USG into a a formula or a tough a form rather where we can see what's going on um, it's a, extremely impressive and we really do appreciate all the work you've put into this well thank you and we appreciate it as well on that I have a question and comment though okay the monies that you have the only one I didn't hear you talk about is what we it looks like it's in the budget from the Department of Insurance what what is y'all's did, was I'm talking about this right. Wasn't there a Department of Insurance money that went to you guys at GTA for this year, or am I speaking before? I'll flip back to the budget. Based on your, your look, I must be talking about something else. Yeah. I'll look so at it later. We're Thanks. Just, we're just looking for the 158 right now. I got you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Good, thank you. So come on up, technology guys. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yeah, this guy turned up. Mm. That'll do it. You want me to test a couple? Yeah, we have sure. Do you up. think somebody, like, kicked it? Maybe. Or hit the power button. Or huh? Interesting. I meant labor, not insurance. Crap, sorry. I was like, I meant labor, not insurance, but I'll grab her offline. All right. All right, y'all. Next up is State Property Officer Marty Smith and State Properties Commission Director Diana Pope. Georgia State Financing Investment Commission. Okay. Diana, the floor is yours. All right. 
Chairman Hatchett, Chairman Tillery, members of the Joint Appropriations Committee, good afternoon and thank you. On behalf of the Georgia State Financing and Investment Commission, the Georgia Building Authority, and the State Properties Commission, we thank you for your time today. So any discussion of debt management needs to start with expressing our thanks for all that you do to support the state's AAA credit rating. As you all know, we are very proud of our AAA rating. This highest rating is assigned to those states that have demonstrated a high degree of creditworthiness to meet financial commitments. We like this map because it gives a great visual of how Georgia compares to the rest of the nation. The states shaded in green reflect those states that are rated AAA by all three of the major credit rating agencies and has significant implications to help keep our borrowing costs at the lowest possible rates. And as often stated by Governor Kemp, Georgia's status as a AAA rated government is also an important economic development tool that signals to investors that Georgia is efficient, fiscally conservative, and a safe bet for investment. The governor's pro budget proposal for amended fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 is very intentional to invest in our capital infrastructure while using tax dollars as efficiently as possible. This slide highlights the reasons we have maintained our AAA credit ratings for over a quarter of a century. We have been able to navigate through various challenges over the years while proving we are worthy of the highest creditworthiness distinction. To get us through those tough times, Georgia demonstrated strong conservative fiscal governance. We, when needed, really tough decisions were made to maintain structural balance, which included painful budget cuts and reducing debt issuance. And then as the economy and revenue strengthened, Georgia demonstrated a strong commitment to build reserves and strengthen the state's liquidity position. I've been with the state since 1994 and during some really tough economic cycles and experienced how during each downturn we learned, we were very intentional to respond well and make our state better prepared for future downturns. So the purpose of this slide is to highlight that we cannot afford to ever take our AAA for granted. And it is one reason we make it a priority each year to present our case to each of the rating agencies. Maintenance of our prime grade ratings requires continued attention to debt and liability management and commitment to strong fiscal governance to support structural balance. In addressing the amended fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 budgets, our presentation will focus on general obligation or geo debt because the General Assembly appropriates funding to the geo debt sinking fund each year to pay annual debt service. And that appropriation is a significant part of the overall budget. In addition, while funding debt service, the state has to also budget for essential programs such as education and health care, public safety, transportation. And we all acknowledge that our budget needs to be structurally balanced to address those costs. Although today's presentation will focus on geo debt, we thought it might be helpful to also talk about some of the other major debt categories. The General Assembly also auth provides authorization for new guaranteed revenue bonds that can be issued by state authorities. The last authorization was in fiscal year 2022, of which there is approximately 200 million remaining of that authorization that can be issued. The state's debt management plan, which will be released soon, combines debt service for both geo and guaranteed revenue debt to show that the state is in compliance with the state's 10% constitutional debt limit, which restricts how much debt can be issued by comparing all existing and unissued authorized debt service to the prior year state's treasury receipts. This 10% restriction is further limited to 7% by, by the board of the Georgia State Financing and Investment Commission. The rating agencies generally look at all tax-supported debt to assess how well, a debt, how well a state is managing its debt. And, comparing the debt to revenue, and, and instead of comparing debt to revenues, the rating agencies compare debt to expenditures. As shown here, tax-supported debt includes additional long-term obligations that are supported by state general funds, even if there is not an official pledge referencing the state revenue supporting the debt. 
conservatively managing the state's debt and other long-term long -term obligations, such as pensions, is critical to support the state's AAA ratings. This slide shows one way the state has responded to various market and economic environments. A major contributor to the state's AAA ratings is the state's proven willingness and ability to maintain fiscal balance to, and adjust expenditures to, to respond to revenue collections. When times are lean, Georgia hunkers down and makes painful adjustments to maintain structural balance and keep from having to use one-time maneuvers to address budget gaps. And when times are good, Georgia is very intentional to take lessons learned to build back its reserves and strategically plan for the future. Maintaining fiscal balance is a priority, and we're so grateful for your actions that support a much-deserved AAA rating. As shown here, when state revenues tanked in response to the Great Recession and caused the debt service ratio to hit a maximum rate of 8.1%, the state's fiscal leaders were very intentional to reduce new debt authorizations. As the revenue environment improved, new authorizations approached more historical levels, and we are now experiencing the lowest debt service ratios in our state's history. To date, over $33.7 billion has been authorized to fund capital projects with state general obligation bonds or guaranteed revenue bonds. Approximately $9.87 billion in principle is currently outstanding. And as previously stated, over $1 billion of the state's overhaul budget goes towards annual debt service payments. Georgia's debt balances are often cited as moderate, and part of that is because our state funds a large portion each year for local school systems for K-12 capital projects. The pie chart shows outstanding amounts by program as of the end of calendar year 23. 60% of outstanding debt, as you see here, is for education projects. Bonds are also outstanding for important economic development and transportation investments along with public safety and other vital capital projects. You are uniquely positioned to be able to make unprecedented capital investments in our state. The governor's amended fiscal year 24 and 25 budgets propose larger than normal capital investments, which will help extend the useful life of existing facilities and also meet future growth needs. And even more significantly, as the governor stated this morning, the 25 budget proposes using surplus cash balances to fund capital projects without adding a single dollar in additional geo debt, saving taxpayers millions in future debt service costs over the next two decades. This slide shows the impact of not adding any geo bond authorizations in fiscal year 25. Assuming a total investment of 900 million, with 20% or $180 million funding five-year projects and 80% or $720 million funding 20-year projects, annual debt service over the next 20 years totals approximately $1.4 billion. This total represents estimated future debt service savings needs from the GEO Debt Sinking Fund. And we're not the only state responding to having additional revenues and looking at other ways to fund capital projects. The rating agencies have noted that recent declines in total state tax-supported debt levels reflects that states have been dedicating PAYGO resources in lieu of borrowing in response to higher increased borrowing costs and also record reserves. As with managing our personal budgets, it makes sense to take advantage of excess cash balances to not only increase our debt, but also to look at ways to reduce the debt portfolio. The governor's amended 24 and 25 budgets propose allocating approximately $137 million for the purpose of providing debt service savings, which further reduces the state's fiscal burden for future generations. As shared earlier, there is over $9.5 billion of principal outstanding in geo debt. Our bonds trade very well, and there are plenty of opportunities for brokers to find us good deals to purchase bonds trading in the secondary market. This slide shows purchases that have been made since July 1 of 2000 and the associated savings to the GEO Debt Sinking Fund. Thank you again for your diligence, your hard work, your commitment to appropriate funds to support our AAA credit rating. We can't say that enough. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marty.
Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Hatchett and Chairman Tillery. Well, we appreciate and committee members uh, appreciate the opportunity to come tell our story. Uh, I, Marty Smith, I uh, serve as a state property officer for the great uh, state of Georgia, and it is a privilege to serve. Uh, under my purview, there are three agencies that I serve. The first one being the Georgia State Finance and Investment, better known as JISFIC. Uh, we handle, it is divided as you got to hear the finance side, and I'll take this time to say, Diane and what she does, if you've never seen for where y'all, the General Assembly commits to the projects and it goes into the bonding all the way to the sales until we get the money uh, to actually spend on these projects, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, Diane and her team are simply amazing to work with and we couldn't do it. Obviously the money has to flow first before the projects and we thank you for that. But the other half of the JISFIC division is the construction that falls under my purview and where we oversee the capital outlay projects and the construction management services for all agencies across the state of Georgia. The other divisions is um, the State Properties Commission, it's uh, better known as SPC. We serve all the real estate and handle the portfolio for the state of Georgia. Uh, we manage it for uh, properties for the state of Georgia as well. We're responsible for all the acquisitions and the dispositions for the Georgia, basically buying and selling for all agencies that we, we help there for state-owned property, excluding the Board of Regents as well as the Department of Transportation. Third and not least is uh, the Georgia Building Authority, better known as GBA. Uh, it's the one that most people are, because it handles everything here, primarily on Capitol Hill. It owns and operates buildings right here in various facilities located around the state, but primarily here on Capitol Hill. Uh, some 32 buildings, over 5 million square feet that we manage here on Capitol Hill and the state capitol, as well as the governor's mansion. Uh, we have numerous buildings, parking facilities, parks and plazas, warehouse complexes. We even manage and oversee seven Confederate cemeteries. Services that are provided by GBA and their staff they include maintenance, renovations, landscaping, housekeeping, event scheduling, food service, parking, and everybody knows as well building access to everything here on Capitol Hill for security. With that, I hope that as you returned for your special called session, and especially now that we're in regular session, I hope that you've been able to notice a lot of the major improvements that's, that's been made here on Capitol Hill, especially here with the transition of the Capitol and the work we've done. The Capitol's a very, very old building and she's very delicate and takes a lot of work. And we hope we've played a lot of catch up and been able to make a lot of changes that y'all been able to notice. And with that, we couldn't have done it without the governors and uh, the General Assembly's backing and support. So I thank you for that. When I came into office in 2019, we actually reported to then was Commissioner Greg Dozier. Mr. Dozier challenged us and said for 10 years they've been trying to get the three agencies located in one place and utilizing the services of all those agencies. With that, we took that challenge on. COVID is a very, very tough situation in 2019. However, some good things did come out. We were able to do an intergovernmental uh, agreement with some of the people that were going to be laid off at the Georgia, Georgia World Congress Center. We were able to pick up about 55 members. We were able to do some internal stuff because the Capitol never shut down. We stayed open for business the whole time. But we took those employees. We were able to do some quick remodeling. And for once on Capitol Hill, all three agencies are together now at Trinity and Washington. And for that, we're very pleased because we do have the shared services of human resources, the legal, and IT. But with that, we put all agencies together simply because of the forethought many, many years ago of making these agencies and putting them together to utilize the strengths and weaknesses of each to combine to make a, a, a good forceful team. I say that because some days we're known as SPC. Some days we're known as JISFIC. But almost every day we're known as GBA. 
And I want to make sure that is well known because we are utilizing the services, our expertise in all three of those divisions to where we are in our culture you, uh, working as one. And with that, we're going to jump into the slides real quick. I'll let Gerald, Gerald Pilgrim uh, take over right here to explain a few. Chairman, thank you all. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about just thinking their project management. And this is just through there. Uh, currently, we have 128 active uh, construction projects, either through CM at risk, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, and our hard bid projects. Um, since 2019, we've had 152 hard bid projects and 55 CM at risk. CM at risk are going to be the larger projects, really $10 million and above. So those are quite substantial projects that we have, and that's what a majority of those were. Um, before 2021, the um, average CM fee, when we were going through it, it was selected by the using agency and GISFIC staff members, and they selected the contractor through an interview process. Basically, the winner was whoever got the most votes out of the committee. 2021, we had, well, in our average fee during that time was 12.29% when everything was said and done. We had some input from some members actually in this room, Chairman Hatchett being one of them, but uh, where we uh, looked at that and in 2021, we actually changed the process. Uh, we actually added a couple of different factors that scoring not only was the interview, but we also was the proximity of the, um, uh, agent, the contractor to the project and also the suitability of the contractor on the project. And then we also included fee as a factor. Fee was 50% of the factor. They narrowed it down to a group of five um, contractors. Basically, what we look at is any of the five should be able to build it or they shouldn't have been selected as the interview process. Once we did that change, our average fee is 8.5%. That's tens of millions of dollars that have gone back since 21 back into the projects to keep those projects moving. So we're very excited about that. 31% reduction in fee. Um, and like I said, 100% of those projects go in there. One thing that we haven't been able to discuss, and we appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with there, was in 2022 and in 2023, uh, GISFIC was given MMR money to do renovations, basically to apply for agencies to apply for grants. It was basically looking for agencies that don't typically get bond funds and we went out and did it. The 2022 was 25 million, 2023 uh, was 10 million. Um, of those projects, they're 80% complete at this time. 90% of the contractors are new vendors to the state of Georgia. They're, they're a majority are local to the communities in which these projects are held. So we are creating jobs and they're helping create jobs in this community through the efforts that y'all have given us. Uh, we've had over 1,500 individuals employed on these projects for a total of 76,000 man hours. So that project has been very successful. Uh, last year, we were um, awarded $20 million to do dem uh, uh, demo projects, to demolish some of the older buildings throughout the state. Uh, we looked at those projects and uh, we had to kind of narrow it down. Basically, we chose the ones that had the highest return on investment so that we could get paid back. How long would it take for the state to lose the operating costs of those buildings to get their investment back? 100% um, of the buildings chosen that were the state buildings are currently occupied and they were all deemed non-salvageable and should not be occupied at this time. And then all the border regents projects that were submitted were able to be funded. Uh, the, due to that, the project is progressing on that one, but due to the age of the buildings, we have to do a lot of historical going back because of the time on it to document everything historically on those to prove that they're not of a historical value. Also, we have to do some remediation, lead, asbestos, all those type of things. That is going on, and so the project is moving forward. Uh, we have the state properties that were selected, the return on investment, so when the state will start seeing a dividends payback is 6.4 years, back on the projects that are state-owned, and 11.4 for the um, Board of Regents. Board of Regents a little bit more because they were more on campuses and centrally located, and the state was a little bit different on there that some of those were not, some of those were unoccupied, the states were all occupied. And we're gonna use the same local participation methodology that we did for GISFIC 1 and 2. 
Additional, uh, additionally, um, there are over 300 agency managed projects that um, total $1.1 billion. Why is that important? Well, JISFIC manages the uh, process of payments. We review all these projects for bond compliance and also the legislative intent. So that's where our office and Diana's office work well together to make sure that goes into it, so to make sure that the projects are moving forward. Additionally, we're responsible uh, through our design review group for all the code compliance, life safety, constructability, and ADA for all state-owned projects. Um, and then additionally, this year, you, we've seen a lot of money in the governor's recommendation where campuses had a lot of money on MMR for um, Department of Corrections, juvenile justice, I think behavioral health, all of that through some of the efforts that our staff was able to help these agencies in doing assessments for their projects. I know that's a hard slide to see, so I apologize for that one. But that is basically a history of the rents. We're going to talk about GBA. The GBA is not appropriated funds directly. We're appropriated funds through rental or intergovernmental agreements through agencies. Agencies have federal funds, state funds, and other enterprise funds that they may be paying their rents from. But what this slide will show you is that our rents since 2018 have, gone, have not gone up any since 2018, fiscal year 2018. So in, at that time, in 2018, GBA had 3 million square feet of rentable office space that we had. Compare that to the Atlanta market rates, even with some of the stuff about everyone saying that the market is turned in Atlanta and everything is going in there, the average office rates right now through all the real estate professionals we ever get to is $33 a foot for full service support. 5% of that $33 a foot goes towards security and the average employee pays $110 a month for um, parking. GBA, in our rent structure, 30% of our rents go towards security with the uh, Department of Public Safety and the, the great work that they do here in funding Capitol Police. Our employees have a parking rate of $20 a month, and then 19% of our rents um, goes towards, we fully fund the State Properties Commission, where the state doesn't appropriate that. We also fund all the operations at the Capitol and other non-revenue producing properties. So the non-revenue producing properties, uh, Mr. Smith's already mentioned, you know, the Capitol, um, we have 360,000 square feet of office space that is non rentable that we don't generate any income off, uh, like the Capitol, uh, Post 50, and others. We also run the uh, mansion, as he's mentioned. GBA also has the seven cemeteries. And so when you look at the total cost, $7.1 million of our budget go toward these, uh, maintaining these properties and toward the Properties Commission. Additionally, we have some uh, major impacts to our budget that are coming in the next year, and we've actually experienced some already. Our cleaning contract that we have that does our night janitorial services, it's at the end of a five-year plan. Right now, we expect in July, we're anticipating at least a $250,000 increase in that annual contract. Our food service operations Two years ago, the day before legis the legislature was convening, our food service vendor quit. They walked out on us. GBA scrambled. We were fortunate enough to be able to hire a lot of the people that were currently at the, at the food service areas. We took them on as direct employees. And then we also looked at trying to go out to outside vendors. Every outside vendor, it looked for us, for us to go bring into wanted us to guarantee them at least two and a half million dollars in profit to be able to do it and that they would control all the costs and all the services. We did not feel that was very good. We want to make sure we have a very limited hours that we can be open for the public, for the citizens here. We're in a food desert. So we feel like that that is actually a benefit for our employees and the legislature and the people to come get us to operate. So we do operate that as a loss. Um, we also last uh, July, we were notified from DOAS 
that we had a $1.1 million increase in our property insurance premiums that we had not budgeted for. So we had to absorb that. We also anticipate this coming year, DPS was able to be, where our budget with them is about $8.4 million. Um, a lot of the raises over the last few years have been fully funded by the Department of Public Safety. So we have actually, they have actually been absorbing a lot of their costs. So with this year, with the raises and everything else, we feel like we need to absorb all the costs for public safety, and that'll be an additional million dollars a year. And then also, um, a lot of y'all have seen the Mullis, the gym. It is a service that we had that we were open last year, and we offer that as an employee benefit and the spousal benefit, and it costs us $350,000 to operate. Additionally, we've been able to um, pass on the pay raises that the state has passed on to the employees. We, we have made that a focus to pass that on since 2819, that it's been $1.9 million in pay raises. We also had a 7% increase across the board on benefits costs that everyone absorbed. So uh, quite substantial amount. I think y'all can probably figure where I'm about to go on that too, so. But let's talk about uh, two peach tree. One of the big things uh, two years ago was us to uh, liquidate two peach tree and get everyone on Capitol Hill. Um, two peach tree, although it was an old building and had a lot of problems, generated a lot of revenue for the Georgia Building Authority. Uh, we had $10.3 um, $10 million of our revenue that we generate each year came from that building. We were able to reduce our expenses when we sold to Peachtree and moved everyone out of there by $3.9 million. This slide, again, it's a hard slide to see, but the slides, this portion to the left are all the contracts that we were able to eliminate, which was just over $3 million of contracts. And then we had 10 positions of GBA positions that we eliminated. So we really did cut. We didn't just pass it on to anything else. We were fortunate that a lot of these jobs were able to be just not filled and through attrition, but we, we completely eliminated those from our budget. Two peach tree, we did sell two peach tree for um, just under $39 million when everything, when all the fees were paid. But where did the money go? What have we done with the funds? Well, we had the, um, the consolidation project on the Capitol. That was the $50 million that we had to bring everyone back onto the um, Hill. That project was about $6 million short when everything was said and done by the time we got there. We also fully funded out of those funds the painting project that was just completed at $5.8 million. We also, in the towers, we had 20 of our floors that had not been touched. So we had 20 floors that looked great and were nice for the employees that had all these major renovations. And we had 20 floors that still had carpet on the walls and old parquet flooring. So we put $7 million to that project and are completely in touch, redoing the bathrooms over there. That project is pretty much complete now. There's a few little touch-ups that they're doing now. And also the GBA law, the, the uh, 195, which is the law building renovation, there, the General Assembly fully funded the amount requested. However, there are some other infrastructure items that attach to the CLOB 254 and 244 that would benefit from having major upgrades so we're not looking at some repairs or having stuff blow up in the middle of session and shut down buildings. So we're, we're putting an additional $6.5 million into that project. Like I mentioned before, our 2024 numbers, we lost quite a bit of revenue. We lost uh, $6.5 million roughly. So our budget was using some of the revenue from Two Peach Tree to make, take, fill that gap. We also have money set aside for Mitchell Street. If we ever get the law building done is to redo Mitchell Street to make it a nicer looking walkable, accessible walkway for that. And then we have $2 million in additional security upgrades that are going on on Capitol Hill. And then we also have chiller upgrades that are happening in the towers. So $39 million is a lot of money, but it goes fast when you start spending millions and millions of dollars at a time. This is what our rents go to. 
like I said, 30% of it go to maintaining these old buildings. 30% goes to public safety. 10% goes to utilities. 7% goes to housekeeping. Um, and go back to security, again, we mentioned that that's a lot higher than average. But, you know, again, we've got a different population here. Utilities were about average for um, commercial buildings throughout the state is having 10% there. We're slightly above average on our housekeeping costs at 7% but we have extra, that's counting all the extra people we bring in during session to be able to handle the, the major crowds that are changing. Also landscaping, 5% of our budget goes to landscaping, which is higher than the state average for commercial buildings, but I think it's one of those things that I'm very proud of the way the capital grounds are looking and the work that they do. Our administration costs, which is finance, purchasing, all those areas, it's 10% IT and parking. In the uh, budget request, you're going to see that there is, the governor's budget request has that there's going to be $10.5 million in additional rents that they've budgeted for agencies to pay GBA to help cover some of the shortfalls. But if we were to take into consideration the uh, salary increases that we didn't do, the benefits that we had, and all the other things, we would be just over $13 million. So, we, and we've lost um, a third of our uh, rental space. So. We feel like we've kind of attacked that and trying to go forward with those areas. Um, Marty mentioned the other agency that we have is the Properties Commission. And just kind of hit a few highlights, and a lot of y'all deal with that, and Chairman Green's in the room, and I think he can speak wonders to what Frank Smith does and the Property Commission does. But one of the things that, you know, as Marty Smith just mentioned, there's 9,383 state-owned buildings. That excludes the Board of Regents, DOT, and DOT. We have almost 2,000 leases, just under a million square feet, oh, I'm sorry, a million acres of state-owned properties. Um, SPC's budget is fully funded by the rents on Capitol Hill by GBA. Last year, GBA was, a, um, SPC was able to bring in $17 million from sales and leases of properties throughout the state. And what's really more rock remarkable is since 2013, when they were authorized to do multi-year leases, there's been $400 million in cost avoidance by being able to get uh, buildings below market rate for longer terms. Um, with that, we'll take questions. Gerald, thank you. You, all of y'all, thank y'all for what you do. You've done, you do a great job. And you're very receptive to any request I have, and I know quite a few people have requests of y'all, so thank you for what you do. Yes, Got a couple of people, y'all, we, we were way behind already. I have had two people that have had their button pressed the whole time. He, they've been presenting, Chairman Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned that you switched. Yes, sir. And I know that was one of Homeland Security's suggestions. Yes, sir. hundred percent and through your effort, Senator Beach, uh, yes. we're able to get that. Uh, yours and uh, Commissioner McMurray's, we're able to do some stuff. The city has signed that co completely over to us last year. So, you said we have four million for that? We have four million dollars for that. So, it's normally closed until the balance Yes, sir. As soon as we have the construction for um, um, the law building, which will be done next summer, we anticipate that construction to start next summer to, for the bollards and the safety bot and having real bollards that will keep cars from coming in. Chairman Lynn Smith. They're not, they're not, they're not working again. They're not working again, so sorry. Diana Pope has served 30 years. Thank you. And with that, we're going to move on. Thank you all very much. You all sorry the mics are not working again, so I don't know what's going on.
Yeah. Yeah, Mom. All right. Next up, Commissioner Christopher Nunn, Department of Community I Affairs. Go forward. It's this right one. Okay. Cool. I don't know why. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to be with y'all. Um, appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'll start off by saying thank you. A, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Uh, B, uh, I know that the hour is late, so thank you for uh, your commitment to this important work. And um, C, thank you for your support for DCA, including uh, the, uh, the, the, this process and participating in many of our activities around the state. Uh, and also the advice that many of you share from share with me from time to time. So, uh, let me uh, before I address the governor's budget recommendations, uh, let me uh, start by offering a brief update on the agency and uh, the work that we've done since last session. Uh, you know, as all of you know, DCA is responsible for a myriad of community development programs and activities, uh, and each of these programs has unique funding sources. Um, I, I don't have time to cover everything we do, but I thought it would be helpful to contextualize uh, the, that our funding is derived primarily from federal sources, uh, followed by state appropriations and other funds. Um, I, I'm gonna, uh, DCA's mission is to help build strong, vibrant communities. I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about uh, many of the different programs, but I, I know that the, the uh, I'm gonna try to talk fast uh, and, and help you make up a little bit of time. Um, our community development division is responsible for comprehensive planning for downtown development, construction codes, and the state's AmeriCorps program. You know, many of you, uh, particularly in rural parts of the state, are probably familiar with the, the Main Street program, 91 Main Street communities across the state. Uh, and while the annual reporting for 23 is due today, uh, if we look at the reporting for last year, uh, 20, 2022, these local uh, programs fostered more than 1,000 new businesses in smaller communities around the state. Um, I think that's a big deal and dem demonstrative of the impact of much of this work. Uh, the Historic Preservation Division, which moved to DCA in 2020, uh, supports preservation through uh, various designations and, and small grants, the Historic Tax Credit Program, as well as the federally mandated environmental review process. You know, as you can see here in the upper right, uh, over the last 10 years, those historic tax credits have helped preserve 771 significant properties in 56 counties across the state. Now, I know housing is a big concern, but it is not a new focus of DCA. Our Housing Finance Division uh, has a portfolio of impactful programs Actually, for 20 years, uh, in partnership with the Georgia Municipal Association and UGA, we've led a community housing initiative uh, that is as important today as it's ever been. Uh, what I appreciate about the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing is, the, is its approach to assessing local needs and developing local housing strategies. Now, to help communities execute some of those strategies, DCA offers several financing resources. Uh, some of those focus on uh, homeowner rehab and neighborhood revitalization, but perhaps the most significant resource in our toolkit are the housing tax credits, uh, federal and state, which are essential to addressing one aspect of the housing continuum. Uh, tax credits enable the development of affordable housing for seniors and families who subsist below the average income. For example, those in the hospitality sector, low-skilled manufacturing, call center operations, and most anyone that is earning uh, less than about $25 an hour. On this map, and I know it may be hard to read, but you get the gist, uh, you can see that we have funded 328 developments since 2019. And these developments are all over the state. Most importantly, whether rehab or new construction, these will provide safe, affordable homes 
for more than 35,000 Georgia households. Now, I'm sure that we all appreciate that home ownership is the ideal, uh, not only for households, but also for communities. Uh, our home ownership division is focused on getting people into and keeping people in their homes. Georgia Dream leverages tax-exempt bond financing and a network of local lenders, along with home buyer education and other resources, to assist first-time home buyers. I'm proud that over the last decade, we've enabled nearly 12,000 households to achieve the dream of home ownership. Um, at the top left, you will note that over the last three years, uh, the annual numbers have declined uh, a bit. Uh, and honestly, the lack of available housing stock, uh, particularly that for first time home buyers, uh, is a contributing factor. And more on that later. Now, housing is important community infrastructure, uh, but it is only one of many community infrastructure needs. Our, housing, our, our community and economic development finance division provides a number of resources to enable healthy, safe, and thriving communities. Primarily through federal community development block grants, DCA has distributed more than $275 million to 204 communities since 2019. And the map on the left shows you the breadth of that distribution. Now, this division is also responsible for economic development incentives and small business lending, the job tax credits, et cetera. For sake of time, I'm gonna focus on the REBA program as it relates to the state's economic development success that the governor spoke about this morning. I understand you'll hear from Commissioner Wilson tomorrow. Uh, I, I know that you understand and appreciate and they will reiterate that activity is, is at a record high all around the state. You know, while I hear a lot of talk about the five largest projects in the state's history, all of which have landed over two fiscal years, uh, it's important to note that the state's economic development team announced 426 expansion and relocation projects last year. Uh, as you'll hear from Commissioner Wilson, you know, not only has there been an uptick in project activity, as you see at the top left, uh, but also the amount of private investment, uh, that's private investment, that that has, uh, has generated. That's increased substantially. Now, not all of these projects involve discretionary incentives. In fact, the vast majority of projects occur as a result of land, local leadership, uh, and job tax credits. But a small number, you know, the most competitive based on uh, quality of jobs, wages, or significant investment, uh, do involve some discretionary incentives that DCA administers. You know, in those cases, DCA works with economic development to determine eligible uses of funds and performance expectations. We then enter into a contract, typically three to five years, with the local development authority and the job creator or the company. DCA manages that contract to ensure that all of these requirements are satisfied. And on the rare occasion where expectations are not met, we either withhold the funding or claw those funds back. It may be worth repeating um, that Georgia does not buy jobs and investment. I did a random file sample of projects and observed that the average discretionary award you know, ranges somewhere in the 750000 to $1.5 million range. Compared to the private investment, those incentives may be 1% often less than the total investment. And as you all know, we are constitutionally prohibited from giving money to companies, as some of our competitor states often do. Whatever we invest in, we take public ownership, whether that be land, infrastructure, or equipment. So REBA and EDGE incentives are simply an, an ante to stay in the site selection process and compete on our own merits. Moving on to the One Georgia Authority, One Georgia is focused on economic growth and vitality in rural parts of the state. The authority is funded through state appropriations, with additional legislative oversight on the authority board. One Georgia comprises several key programs, 
the equity program invests in rural economic development capacity. You can see here on the map on the left, all of those red dots indicate equity investments since 2019. For example, Candler County last year requested $500,000 to assist with extending public infrastructure in an industrial park that was at capacity. This new infrastructure would open up additional parcels for them to market, and the authority matched the local contribution uh, to complete this, uh, th this project. Ultimately, by the end of the year, two companies had announced plans to locate in this, uh, in this park. One, a local entrepreneur who was starting an ag-related business, and the other was a Hyundai supplier. Now, I honestly, I wish that every equity investment paid, a paid off a return that quickly. <laughs> um, the next program is the Workforce Housing Program, which is our newest initiative, thanks to your support with $35.7 million of seed funding last year. Uh, it may surprise you that programs like this are not simple to launch. Uh, it's not just an issue of new contracts and processes and infrastructure, but also working with community applicants to identify needs, to develop partnerships, and to encourage applications. I was extremely proud of our teams working together to launch this program in two short months. To date, we have extended nine awards that will yield more than 818 new homes in six rural regions, from Seminole County in southwest Georgia to Stevens County in the Georgia mountains. The interest in this program is high and continues to grow. Lastly, the EDGE program, which is a competitive deal closing fund similar to REBA, but focused on rural Georgia. Without getting too into the weeds on the process from the point where an offer may be extended, uh, you know, whether it's, where it's accepted, where it's actually awarded and finalized, you know, I will highlight that over the last uh, five years, we have awarded 39, finalized 39 econo economic development edge awards uh, in 28 rural counties. And those 39 awards have yielded 8,000 new jobs helped us to retain 7,000 and yielded nearly 2.5 billion in, invest in private investment. Moving on, I, I, coming back to housing for just a moment, uh, rental assistance is 100% federally funded, but I do wanna highlight one important point uh, that illustrates the challenge of housing affordability, especially to our lowest income workforce and fixed income seniors. So nearly 42,000 Georgians rely on DCA for rental assistance. That's about 12,000 vouchers currently. Uh, and as a normal practice, we opened our wait list last fall. That's not vouchers. That is simply the wait list to be contacted should vouchers become available. In four days, we had 175,000 plus applications for assistance, which is emblematic of some of the challenges that we seek to address. Uh, next, I'll move on in the Homeless and Special Needs Housing Division. Um, here, the State Housing Trust Fund is an important and vital resource as it enables the state to draw federal funding that is then subgranted to service providers across the state. These funds and the federal resources that they unlock through HUD's Continuum of Care, which is a very wonky concept that I haven't time to explain today, Katie can help me, um, you know, have, uh, have been relatively constant for decades. Uh, again, I'm gonna come back to that later, but before we move on to the recommendations, I would be remiss not to highlight the fact that I know you all appreciate all of this work and activity uh, occurs and requires adequate accounting, IT, legal, and other administrative support. And I don't want to gloss over that because when you consider the number of grants and loans and contracts that DCA administers, this is a significant effort. And I am really proud of the lean organization that we operate. So now let me turn to the governor's budget recommendations. 
Um, and I'll, I'll try to move quickly. Uh, hopefully I'm not speaking too, too fast, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, throughout, you will find enterprise adjustments related to the $1,000 per state employee uh, that was recently included in our paychecks. Thank you very much. Uh, as well as uh, the proposed 4% increase in the FY25 budget. Cumulatively, uh, these amount to $528,567 in the amended uh, and 260,000 uh, and change in the base budget. Under special housing initiatives, uh, I mentioned that the, that the funding for the State Housing Trust Fund has been constant for a long time. In the amended budget, uh, we have requested additional funds for a $2.9 million required state match for an $11 million youth homelessness grant from HUD. The governor's office recommends uh, that this be funded with $2,124,806 in new funding uh, combined with $1.2 million in redirected funds. Those redirects include $800,000 in special housing initiatives and $400,000 from the state community development programs. Cumulatively, that satisfies the required state match for the uh, youth homelessness grant. In the same section, special housing initiatives looking at the base budget, we propose using the same 1.2 million of redirected funds plus an additional 3,797,416 uh, in appropriated funding to provide 4.6 million of funds to pursue a variety of other competitive federal grant funds to address homeless concerns. Yet while we anticipate the availability of these grants, uh, notices have not yet been distributed and the application cycles won't necessarily align with the state budget process, hence the request for funding, uh, matching funding in the State Housing Trust Fund. I just touched on the 400,000 redirect from state community development programs in both the F, uh, amended 24 and the FY25 budget. Uh, you will note in the 25 budget, there is also an additional reduction of $302,087. That's for broadband funds uh, that have been used to support our broadband mapping effort. Um, in conjunction with GTA, who you heard from earlier, we plan to use some federal funding to continue those efforts, hence the program reduction here. Next, under state economic development programs, uh, the governor recommends a $100 million amended budget ad to support statewide economic development activity, specifically the REBA program. Uh, despite the increased activity that we spoke about earlier, the annual budget for REBA has actually been reduced from $27 million in 2018 to $13 million today. And that simply doesn't support the current level of activity. Consequently, uh, we must address the current needs in the amended budget. Last year, you provided amended appropriations specifically for three exceptional projects. This year, we're requesting funds both to address the current pipeline of activity and to replenish our working reserves that have been exhausted with the record level of activity over the last two years, particularly those five large projects I mentioned earlier. Three things to note on this front. First, this funding is essential to our momentum and continued economic development success. For, for years, decades in fact, Georgia has employed a model that enables us to respond at the speed of business. When speaking about our recognition as the number one state in the nation for business 10 years in a row, Governor Kemp sometimes touts the, the, the data that makes that, those rankings up. Uh, Georgia ranks top in seven categories, but one he likes to highlight is cooperative and responsive state government. Well, that responsiveness is not just a function of the executive and legislative branches working together and state agencies like ours collaborating, but it also has to do with our time-tested approach that enables Georgia to operate at the speed of business. Second, this funding supports regionally significant projects literally anywhere in the state, from the coast to South Georgia to Metro Atlanta. As I was reviewing the sample of projects uh, files, I was once again struck by the breadth and flexibility of this regional economic tool. 
third, uh, we're not asking for any additional funds in the base budget, but that does mean that we've got to true this funding up in the amended to address the actual project activity and ongoing project program needs. Moving on to the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority, which is administratively attached to DCA, I expect you'll hear from Executive Director Hunter Hill uh, at some point. Uh, you know, he and his team are doing outstanding work to address extraordinary water and sewer needs statewide. Uh, this $250 million ad in GFA's Georgia Fund is important to addressing expanding needs across the state. Finally, there are three items in one Georgia that I will take one by one. Uh, like Reba, first of all, uh, EDGE has been exhausted as well over the last two years. One Georgia's base appropriation, roughly $21 million, down from $48 million a decade ago, has not allowed EDGE to keep up with the current level of economic activity in rural Georgia, particularly over the last two years. The governor is recommending the addition of $100 million in the amended to replenish EDGE, both the current project pipeline as well as adequate working reserves, but also this funding will support the new rural site development initiative, which I know he alluded to this morning. And I don't want to get out ahead of Commissioner Wilson, but he and I both have concerns, and I know several of you have shared these as well, that uh, about the dearth of construction-ready sites across the state. That is, sites that have utilities and infrastructure in place that site selectors today put a premium on. The second one Georgia item relates to the workforce housing program where we have already begun to make an impact. The governor's proposed continuing this initiative with $50 million plus an additional $6 million in the base. In the amended, you'll note an add of $23,921,179, which combined with $26.1 million of residual funds from the discontinued rural innovation program, this amounts to $50 million for workforce housing. Rural innovation uh, accounted for $5 million in the FY24 budget, and the governor recommends repurposing those funds uh, and an additional $1 million in disregarded funding to provide $6 million in the base. Depending on the circumstances uh, this time next year and the trajectory of this program, I envision a scenario where we'll be having a similar conversation uh, in the amended next time, uh, or this time next year, uh, about, uh, about this very successful program. And last but certainly not least, uh, the governor recommends transferring $450,000 in the base budget from One Georgia to the Department of Economic Development for the Rural Strike Force Program uh, to more accurately reflect the administrative arrangements for that particular program. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take a breath. Thank you again uh, and uh, take any questions you may have. I thought you were going to catch us up. You got, you did good to start with, but you slowed Sorry. down. Senator Lucas. Commissioner. It's working. The mics are working. There should be. Commissioner, what do I have to do to get you to come to Hancock County and Johnson County? I need some help. Uh, j just see me afterwards when we get on the calendar. I'm through there all the time, so look forward to meeting you while we're there. Representative Gamble. Thank, thank you, Commissioner, back here in the back. Um, I had a question. I know there's a lot of investment in the um, infrastructure this year for our local communities. Is there currently a limit on the amount that a, that a, that a county can get through GFA? Is it a $25 million limit? Uh, there, there is that, and I will tell you, A, that's a great question for uh, Executive Director Hill. I do sit on the board and I do know that there is a limit, but I'm really hesitant to tell you what it is. I think you are right, but l let, me, let me follow up and, uh, and make sure that we've got that correct. Good. So. I, I think it would be good as, as we have this additional money, you know, there might be some consideration if that is the case that we at least have some type of waiver process for our communities that have these large projects coming that that may be a little bit low uh, to handle the volume of what some of us are experiencing I just wanted to mention that yeah so just like I believe that you are right about the uh, limit I also believe that there is a waiver process uh, in place because I know from time to time we may see some but again let me follow up with you after I uh, after I speak with Hunter Senator Davenport Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
<coughs> Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I was concerned about the housing assistance and food assistance, and I think I asked you last year uh, about that and the money that we got from the feds, and you said it went straight to the counties and the counties distributed. Can you tell me today for a fact that the counties are helping people, and if they have not, have they uh, returned the money? Uh, I'm not sure if it's the CARES money or whatever, but if they have not, if they have not, did they return the money? And if they have, have they been accountable for it? Have they? Uh, do you have an audit? Can, where can I see this audit? Uh, do we have to go to the counties and ask them? And they kick, they kick, uh, 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 kick rocks all day and never answer the question. So uh, there's a lot packed into that, and I'm, I'm trying to isolate the, the specific program, but I think what you're asking about is the emergency rental assistance funding uh, that, that flowed to the state uh, that was dispersed. And yes, we, along with our 12 uh, local partners in that program, distributed you know, a billion two uh, out of that program. I glossed over it because I was trying to make up some time for the chairman. Um, but we, we did use some residual administrative funding uh, from that program to stand up a two-year uh, eviction prevention program with two service providers, Georgia Legal Services and Atlanta Legal Aid. Uh, you know, if you if you think about it, they're running a program that is that they have about 20 to 25 million dollars a year to uh, to run. Uh, at the height, we were dis distributing about uh, 70 million dollars a month communion. Com uh, cumulatively with our partners. So yes, all of that money has been exhausted and those were finite federal funds. Representative Buckner. Um, thank you for your presentation. I learned a lot. Um, housing issues have been brought to me quite a bit recently and in some communities there are some really well built out of style homes from the 1920s and 30s which are actually historic homes now and um, those neighborhoods are kind of declining I hate to say that they're becoming a blight but some of them are um, and so my idea was is there a way that we could go into some of those communities as a neighborhood and work toward affordable workforce, low-income housing, um, which would ultimately maybe eliminate the blight, the crime, and, and regenerate that community to be flourishing and thriving again. And in particular, I'm thinking about the tax credits that were mentioned. Some of them are, the, I, the word I use is stackable. You can have multiple, like a historic one and affordable housing one. Or, are they stackable? Is there something we need to do legislatively to make that where that could happen for those communities to be renovated? Right. So, so uh, on the last point, I'd love to have a conversation offline about how uh, how you might be able to to better leverage those tools. But you're exactly right. Um, the historic tax credits, uh, a portion of those, not the commercial po component that goes to do to redevelop kind of large scale developments, uh, but the historic home component absolutely is an important tool when you look at it through a housing lens. And I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, we, we had had a, a sidebar, but never followed up. So I, I will uh, I will circle up with you, and I may pull my historic preservation team in in that conversation as well. Thank you. Got a question. Uh, quickly commissioner I'm just following along the state community development programs the 400 that came out I'm just trying to track what it was it looks like would that be the helping hands in home uh, in hunger program and the 211 that, that is my understanding away? yes okay so those were what was being proposed to be cut all right representative Becky Evans thank you thank you so much commissioner so I just want to uh, confirm that for new housing initiatives for this year we so we have the we have the rural workforce housing which we had last year and we have it this year 37 million last year 50 million this year and then but uh, has there been any increase in the dream and the home ownership program so the the georgia dream home ownership program is funded entirely through bond uh, issuance um cr the the last three years uh, let me go back to that slide. I'm, I know you're. Um, 
the, the last three years, uh, in, in part due to, um, due to the uh, lack of first time, our average home price uh, in the Georgia Dream program is about $201,000. You go look on the MLS, you know, there's not a lot of properties in the state at $201,000, right? So um, the last three years, we have not used up all of our bond issuance authority to extend uh, first time home buyers uh, mortgages, but that is something that we uh, continue, we're through a lot of different things, and I'd love to talk with you offline about this because it's actually a longer conversation than I'm gonna be allowed time for. It is, it is a big push for us to get people into homes, and, and uh, that, that is, it's not a state appropriation item. Okay, all right, great, and I just wanna confirm, and then set this, uh, this other thing that's new is the state housing initiative in the, Money, new new funds going into that to leverage more federal funds. Is that right? That, that's correct. Any? There are at least a half a dozen grant opportunities mm -hmm. that we know from our contacts with HUD. We're a very major HUD partner that are in the that are in the planning phases, but they've not been. It's called a notice of funding availability or NOFA. That NOFA has not been uh, laid out. So those are those are funds that we will pursue, provided the additional funding. Thank to match you. commissioner that's it congratulations thank you oh and and uh thank you and, and if i might say one thing um you know if this doesn't tell you how we collaborate as uh as state governments uh hunter hill has already gotten back to me and that is in the process of increasing that uh that that limit so um we do work well together and thank you all very much thanks buddy. thank you next up is the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation, Mr. McMurray. It's hot. It's hot. Feels good. Feels good. Welcome to the last presenter, Mr. Money Man. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right, Co Commissioner McMurray. Hold on, we'll let. There's still a few people coming in and out. Let them get in and out. It's probably all your team. It's good to have entourage. They'll keep you straight. All right, Commissioner McMurray, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, I'd first like to start by recognizing two of our board members who are with us today. They may be entering. Uh, we have uh, Ann Purcell, our vice chair from the 1st Congressional District, and Miss Stacy Key. Uh, there's Ann in the back left, and Miss Stacy Key from the mighty 5th Congressional District, as she makes me uh, refer to her. Uh, so thank, I want to thank them for their support of the board for GDOT and also their work with you here in the House and Senate on your transportation issues. So thank them for being here today. I understand your day has been long and it is hot in here. It's not hot outside, but it's hot in here. So I'll try to be short since your day has been long. I was really excited uh, to see the governor's budget recommendation and certainly appreciated his comments this morning. So let me just jump right to it. And as you look at the Georgia DOT budget, I just wanted to remind you that you're going to see four different fund sources that refers to our budget. Uh, one is motor fuel. Then you'll see the transportation trust fund, which consists of the alternative vehicle fee, the heavy vehicle impact fee, and the hotel fees. That constitutes, those are the three revenue sources that constitutes the transportation trust fund. Then we have the transit trust fund, which comes from the ride share fees, and of course, state general funds as well. So let me take a look, let me show you on the next slide how we deploy these revenues and what we did last fiscal year as it relates to our capital construction program. So this is, this is delivering projects uh, here in Georgia. Uh, as you can see, we executed 1,638 professional services contracts valued at $695 million. These are contracts for consultant services to do things such as design, geotechnical work, uh, environmental work, 
right-of-way services, the purchasing of right-of-way, and also construction management. So this is the consultant resources that we use to supplement our staff to deliver the capital pro projects throughout the entire state. Also, you can see that we acquired 1,634 parcels of right-of-way or easements across the state, uh, which is no small feat in itself. Uh, if you think about every right-of-way transaction you've ever done, ours are the same ways with closings and uh, est uh, estimates and all those kind of things to get to a closing. And you'll see that we bid 301 projects, totaling a little over $2 billion last fiscal year. Now, out of the 301 projects we bid, we did reject 25 projects, uh, which totaled about $422 million. We rejected those bids and we repackaged some of those to make uh, big projects into smaller projects, and we simply rebid some projects as well. So why did we reject 25 projects? Those were due to high prices. And so on the next slide, I'd like to share with you a little bit of a national perspective on cost. And you've got some of that this morning from the state economist. But this is a very busy chart from the Federal Highway Administration. And it's also an eye test for this late uh, hour of the day. Uh, what this chart rec is uh, representative of is the Highway Construction Cost Index, which consists of asphalt, cement, reinforcing steel, electrical, thing, electrical conduits, uh, concrete and other commodities that go into projects. So this is actual cost data from across the United States the Federal Highway keeps track of. Now what I want to show you is the National Highway Construction Cost Index is the red line and you can see NHCCI there to the top right. Uh, the CPI that you talked about first thing this morning is the blue dash line toward the bottom. The power producer index is the green line, and the employment cost index is the yellow line. So this is basically comparing all the indexes of those various and sundry indexes uh, to each other. The main point here is the orange area below the red line down to CPI is making a point that basically the transportation and construction cost is outpacing even that of CPI. Most people think about inflation and costs related to definitely to CPI. In fact, from Q2 of 2020 to Q2 of 2023, the Highway Construction Cost Index increased by 51%. So you can see a 51% increase in those costs. Now that's the national perspective. Let me drive this home just a little bit closer to us here in Georgia of the cost of doing business. In the top table, you can see the percent increases of the going back from December 2020 to October 2023 that we've realized in bidding projects. And I'll start there with resurfacing, an 80% increase. But what that really means now is it costs $335,000 per mile to resurface a two-lane road. So think about that, 335,000 miles per mile for a two-lane road. A roundabout uh, has increased by 114%. Uh, average cost for a two-lane roundabout now is $3.4 million. And widening, you can see that widening has increased on average by 118%. And if you look at urban widening uh, in an urban area from two lanes to four lanes, that is now averaging about $19 million a mile to widen a road from two lanes to four lanes. And we've actually seen higher costs of that in some areas. Now the bottom table is, I wanna talk about routine maintenance contracting. So the contracting that we do to the private sector to do things like pavement preservation, uh, patching, crack filling, guardrail repair, sign repair, things like that. So in fiscal year 2020, we bid 238 contracts with the average cost being $428,000. In 2023, we only were able to do 139 contracts, that's 99 different, at $620,000 on average, which represents a $192,000 cost increase on average per contract. So the dollars didn't allow us to go as far. We couldn't do as much work because of the increased cost, basically. So simply put, a dollar or hundreds of millions of dollars just don't go as far as they used to. 
That's why the governor's budget recommendation is so important for our Georgia's transportation infrastructure future. So let's look at the uh, budget highlights for amendment 24. And let me start again by a thank you. A sincere thank you for your support for the employee pay raises as in the amended budget year, as well as FY25. The FY24 pay raise is helping with our retention. We're currently at 3,900 employees. We're really striving, striving to try to get to 4,000 or more. Last year when I stood in this very place, we were at 3,775 employees. So uh, the increase in uh, pay has certainly helped with our retention rates. And I might add, our employees are truly amazing and our most valuable asset we have. And I'm able to say that today from our district in Northwest Georgia and our district in Northeast Georgia who started Sunday pre-treating roads based on this weather forecast that we had and the inclement weather that was experienced in the very Northwest part of Georgia. They started on Sunday and have been working around the clock ever since and uh, I'm glad for the sunshine and the uh, wind even though it is cold. So be careful for black ice still, that's your warning. Uh, again, a uh, big thank you for them. So let's start with our revenue for amended 24 and take a, a quick dive into that. Just going to highlight the 57.9 increase in motor fuel, which represents interest earnings uh, adjustment and $1.506 billion in state general funds. Uh, so let's take a look at where those $1.5 billion are going to be used. If you want to look on the summary, that's on page 375, I believe. But I'm going to draw your attention to the capital construction program. And line item two says, provide funds to expedite the department's existing project pipeline. So you can see that there's a $659 million add in state general funds to our capital construction program and an $8.5 million add in motor fuel to the capital construction program bringing it to $1.68 billion. As you just saw, those cost increases of project costs that I talked about, uh, this additional funding will keep us, moving, keep, keep us moving the projects that we're currently working on forward and will give us the capability to advance other project phases like design, right-of-way, or construction uh, into future, move those projects ahead, basically. Uh, so based on the timing of the amended fiscal year, uh, it's likely that we'll start deploying these dollars this fiscal year, but the most of those certainly will be deployed into next fiscal year, just based on the timing of the budget and bidding projects and getting things moving. Uh, we're committed to working with our transportation committee chairs as we move through this session and as we work uh, with our team at planning to move forward strategically on what projects uh, get the benefit of this additional revenue. Now let me turn your attention to the local maintenance improvement grant program. And line two there talked about providing a one-time uh, state general funds for the additional support of local transportation infrastructure projects. And that's exactly what that local maintenance improvement grant program is, is the formula dollars that go right out to our cities and counties. The $200 million ad is basically a doubling of the LMIG budgets. And just like us at DOT, the cities and the counties have experienced the same cost increases that we've seen. We look forward to working with ACCG and GMA on deploying these LMIG funds strategically to all the cities and the counties across the state. Listen, this is truly a wonderful ad for our cities and counties that have all have significant maintenance needs uh, from resurfacing to repairing bridges and pipes and safety projects as well. Uh, so just a wonderful opportunity for our cities and counties uh, that have tremendous needs. Let me stay with the maintenance theme just for a moment. And on the next slide, we're going to look at the routine maintenance budget. So routine maintenance is just the upkeep of our roadways and roadsides. Uh, and so this was one of the bigger ads for motor fuel, $32.4 million of motor fuel. Uh, was deployed to routine maintenance. Uh, that represents about a 7% increase in the routine maintenance budget, and those dollars will go directly toward uh, taking on the increased cost and co uh, maintenance contracting costs that I've shared with you in a previous slide. Now let's move to the biggest, uh, one of the new programs as well that I'm super excited about, uh, and we're very excited to have funding for Georgia's freight future. Uh, 
you heard at eggs and issues, Chris Clark give the 91% growth in tonnage out to the year 2050. I always remind people that we're almost equal distance to 2050 as we were to 1999. That doesn't seem like that long ago, thinking back to 1999. Uh, but uh, what Chris didn't tell you is the makeup of that number. We will see 96% increase in freight tonnage on Georgia's highways, 69% of tonnage growth on Georgia railways that aggregate to be that 91%. The other thing Chris didn't share with you there is we know that the congestion cost back in 2015 for freight on a daily basis was about $14 million. When we project the congestion cost of freight to 2050 without doing anything, that number is more than two times greater at over $33 million on a daily basis of congestion unless we did something about it. That's why this program is so important. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the planning division will be posting the 2024 freight plan, a business-focused planning analysis. That builds upon a joint study committee between the House and Senate going back to 2020, 2020 and some subsequent study committees, as well as all the great work that Janine Miller and the planning division has done. Things like the Coastal Empire Study, the I-85 Planning and Environmental Linkage Study, the Troop County Study, the State Route 365 uh, Study where the inland ports going up in Gainesville. Just to mention a few of the, all the studies of freight-focused uh, work that planning has done. Uh, this funding will absolutely allow us to get started on things that we did not have funding to get started on. And it will certainly help us to advance the things that we're already advancing and freight focused and hope to accelerate those. Again, we look forward to working with our transportation committee chairs as, as we move forward through this session and keep you updated on what these uh, additional revenues will do. Moving very quickly into 25, again, just a few highlights. We'll start with the revenue. Uh, revenue is add $113.3 million to bring the FY25 budget to $2.5 billion. You can see the distribution between motor fuel, transportation trust fund, transit trust fund, and general funds uh, here in this table. Now let me just sort of share with you on a few items of where the bulk of the additional revenue is being utilized. We'll start in capital maintenance, uh, adding $35.3 million, uh, which brings us to a total of $194.7 million, which will leverage federal money uh, to be over right around over $400 million for capital maintenance. Capital maintenance is resurfacing, rehabilitation, bridge repair, and bridge maintenance, capital bridge maintenance. Uh, as I said, resurfacing has increased by 80% since 2020, so this helps to uh, deal with those increased costs and will help us address our capital maintenance needs across all of Georgia. Uh, on the next slide here, I just want to again bring, call your attention to the LMIG program. Uh, the $7.3 million increase in FY25 is representative of the increase in excise collections to brings it to 220 million that 220 million in FY 25 and with the amended year brings the LMIG budget to 638.7 million dollars that is a really big deal for our cities and counties across this state it's a fantastic opportunity for them to work on the backlog of projects that they have uh, next I just call your attention to another big ad it was 34.5 million in routine maintenance uh, the same as we had in amended 24, 27.4 million of that 34 million is going to go right after the increased materials cost and contracting cost. And the lastly, uh, let me just call your attention to traffic management, a $4.94 million ad uh, to uh, 3.9 million of that's going toward increased traffic operation project costs. So you think about the technology projects, the signs, the cameras, and we're even putting broadband along our interstates now uh, to deal with increased project costs. But very importantly, part of that $3.9 million is going to go to address recruitment and retention with our HERO program. Back last year, we had to reduce our HERO program from 24-7 uh, to reduce their hours and also scale down their coverage area because out of 120 HERO operators, we've got down to 30, okay? 
The good news is we've built back to about 80 through a lot of recruitment and retention, just as I mentioned through the previous uh, uh, thanks of, of what the increases have done has certainly helped retention, but we still have work to do. We bring HERO uh, trainees in just under $20 an hour and then move them to $20 an hour once they become permanent. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Uh, it's one of the most popular programs we have, and if you've ever been helped by HERO, you know how they got their name. I will add that we've backfilled what the heroes, when we had to shrink their hours of operation and their coverage, we've backfilled that with the CHAMP program that you see outside of Metro Atlanta to cover that. So a, a very small ad out of a big budget, but a very critical ad, again, to invest in our people so that we can cover uh, the roadways of Georgia and keep things safe for our first responders out there and you who may have a flat tire or need a gallon of gas. Um, we look forward to working with the subcommittees, Mr. Chairman, uh, as these budgets move forward. Uh, we sincerely thank you for your support of Georgia's uh, transportation infrastructure and the work you've done here at Joint Appropriations, and I'll be glad to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you Commissioner. Um, page four of your presentation is the National Highway Construction Cost Graph. You mentioned a day where basically cost I think you said doubled you may not have said doubled and I can't remember when that was but that doesn't really matter what if you could put your finger on one or two things that really caused the cost to increase what what would that be well uh, you know I'm not an economist I'm an engineer but I play an economist at work uh, so uh, a couple things uh, one is energy so if you look at the power production index, uh, the, the green line, uh, energy to make raw materials and products has an impact. Sort of the interesting thing here, though, is as you see that PPI line going down, the highway construction cost index has not reflected there. The other thing that drives uh, construction commodities prices is uh, the uh, dollar barrel of oil. So uh, petroleum products drive a lot of the cost as well. So when you see oil, prices go up on a per barrel cost, you'll see those uh, commodity costs rise as well. Uh, labor is a component of that as well, as, as labor has continued to increase. And uh, uh, as you heard this morning, you know, nobody wants to let anybody go. So uh, salaries and wages have risen as well. But uh, the biggest things are uh, the power production uh, and the correlation to the barrel of oil, which has a lot of those commodities. There still, uh, still was an impact to uh, sort of globally, worldwide, with the uh, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, that has had an impact on the world steel supply. As big as we like to think we are, we met with a steel producer who reminded us that transportation is a very small user of steel compared to dural other durable goods and auto manufacturers and people like that. So, uh, those so, are the big impacts. So Mr. you Chair. didn't mention demand, and I, I would almost think that in Georgia that could be part of the the issue because as we all know there's orange cones everywhere um, but I, I just I'm wondering you know we're putting a lot of money in there we've got local communities that basically are bidding against each other for the ability to have stuff done I know there's been some discussions about groups getting together to possibly form a bigger conglomerate maybe counties or whatever to try to get a better cost do you think that is at all possible or could be done or would it be fruitless yeah uh, a couple things to respond to that very good question is certainly aggregating and scale of economy can be good a lot of cities uh, will go with counties sometime to bid their resurfacing so they get a bigger package uh, the issue now is risk, though, uh, is if it gets too big and too long, then uh, contractors are having to build the volatility, so you're going to pay for that risk up front. But back to the sort of supply and demand, we did a pretty good look, a hard look, earlier or late last year, and we're still averaging over three bidders per project, and on bigger projects, we're seeing four and five bidders. So we have ample competition, and we did an analysis of the capacity of the contractors to do work. So every project we do and bid, the contractor has to put up a performance bond. And they have to get you know, credit that basically says they have the capacity 
to build this project. If not, the bonding company has to take over. So when we looked at last year's 301, last fiscal year's 301 bids, there was still the winners only. So just the people that won still had over $12 billion of bonding capacity available. So the financial markets say the contractors have the capacity. You know, on a daily basis, does it, is it hard to hire people? Yes, everybody's got the same challenges. Uh, so, but when you look at that capacity, uh, I'm not sure that there's a lot of bidding against each other. It's just the fact of uh, unknowns and bidding risk over time. That's why we've taken some of the big projects and chopped them into smaller projects so that there's more quanti less quantifi or more quantifiable risk and less risky of time over a project that may have a three to four year duration. Thank you. Senator Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The other issue you didn't mention was right away. And I know that's, at least in the metro area, it's been a major cost in projects. And I've been telling my cities and in my county, Cherokee County, they want to build that ball ground bypass. I said, is, acquire as much right away as you can and we'll, we'll get the construction money later, but that land's gonna continue to, to increase in value. I believe Will Rogers said it best, when you better buy all you can because they're not making any more of it, so. Okay. Representative Vance Smith. Oh, don't tell me. The question was about Airport A I, for those I, online. I was able to hear it. So to restate the question, was just a, a question about Airport A. Notice that there was no change. You're, you're correct. Uh, there was no change in the F amended 24 or 25. Um, the, uh, I can tell you that we did a call for projects for uh, fiscal year 25. We're already trying to work, work ahead on that. Uh, I'm uh, trying to thumb to a number. We had somewhere around 400 uh, projects submitted for over $400 million. Uh, that would include federal, which is about another 20 to 40 million. But as you can see, our line item of airport aid is around 26 million or so. I'm shooting from the hip here, trying to page. But so we'd welcome a conversation. Obviously, there's a tremendous need uh, for airport aid uh, around this state. Senator Sims. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, are there any matching funds for unpaved roads? And do we get a discount if we just pave one instead of two sides of the road? Because we had a lot of dirt roads in Southwest so, Georgia. So the, the LMIG <laughs> requires the local maintenance side. improvement uh, grant uh, is either a 10% uh, match if you're in a TIA region, uh, uh, TSPOS region, or it's a 30% match if you're not. So that, that is the, uh, we don't have money to match. We actually look for local governments to match the LMIG money. And generally federal dollars are not available to pave unpaved roads. They don't meet the high enough threshold for federal dollars. But this is a, this is a, a really a, a tremendous boost with the additional 200 million in the amended budget year for local governments. But they do have a match. Chairman Jaspers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, I didn't want to let this moment go by without, uh, you know, as we were putting our heads to sleep last night, your employees are all over North Georgia. And um, I had a commissioner call me this morning saying thank you. He said, if I saw you, to make sure I told you that. And, uh, and I appreciate and I really appreciate the governor's thing. I, got, I think everyone in here should have, or should, especially on the transportation committee, has gotten a text from your mayors and commissioners about doubling the LMIG money. I mean, that's gonna make the biggest impact that they can go home with from us to them. It'll make a big impact in their communities. Thank you. Chairman Lee Anderson. Commissioner, I want to thank you, but your mic's working. Mine works. It should. Commissioner, I want to thank you for your department and the great job y'all do. Uh, my question is, how much 
have you done a study on how much money we're losing on motor vehicle uh, that are electric cars versus on the motor tax? I mean, how much are we losing on revenue? So actually, uh, Senator, thanks for that great question. That's, that's a question I get a lot. So actually part of that transportation trust fund dollars are the alternative fuel vehicle, meaning if you have an electric vehicle, you pay an annual registration rate. Uh, that is commensurate with uh, basically the state excise tax and federal excise tax. So we're not technically losing uh, at this juncture. Uh, if the fleet became 100% EV, that's a, probably a different discussion, but at this moment, there's really not a loss of revenue. We, we're probably seeing a bigger impact to revenue, and we had some studies, uh, joint study com committee, uh, I guess two years ago now, time flies, uh, and probably the biggest impact to revenue is just the fuel, overall fuel efficiency continuing to get a lot better. Uh, and I might add that uh, to this joint appropriations committee, we are in a pilot now uh, we're through the end of February to look at how uh, mileage, a uh, mileage based user fee basically for paying based on how much you drive, not the type of vehicle you drive. So, uh, so it was a pilot, not, not anything from a policy point of view, but that's underway right now. So we look forward to seeing what those outcomes may be and reporting back certainly to their transportation committees of what that information may be. Thank you. Chairman, Chairman Perkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and so I have two questions. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to have to answer them now. Uh, Monday morning, we do have a, a committee meeting. I look forward to having you at. Uh, the first has to do with the state-owned railroad. railroad. Uh, so we have so many miles, and we have made a concerted effort over the last five years to upgrade our state-owned rail lines. Uh, and it seems like we have about 30 percent left. I wanted to see if I could be wrong. but. Um, if there are plans and continued upgrade in those rail lines. And secondly, um, if we could have a conversation about the ride share fees, the portion that goes to rural transit that we had talked about um, uh, for, for several years. And, uh, and, and those, not necessarily, unless you have them off the top of your, you know, that probably was not in the top of your notes. Um, and we could discuss that Monday if you don't have it here. I would, I'd love to discuss it in detail Monday. I'll just give you a little preview. Obviously on state-owned state, state owned rail, we do have prioritization and list. Uh, I will, a d little deeper dive is if you look at that, it's locomotive diesel tax and a, and a new change in law uh, that where we do have a competitive process now for short line operators to uh, compete for those dollars. Uh, and so, and there's some criteria on that. We can talk about that in more detail. And then on, on rideshare, we're very excited that now we're in the second budget year that since you've appropriated the rideshare fees that we're actually using a formula distribution to all the rural transit providers outside the ATL. The ATL uh, here in Metro Atlanta gets a portion of that money. The other portion of that money is being used to all the rural transit providers to not supplement or supplant anything that they're doing to provide enhanced service or helping their helping uh, their overall operations to do more, again, not supplant local Additions, dollars. Additions, not supplant. Uh, that's correct. And so we're very excited about that. It's been a wildly successful program and look forward to reporting more to you on that in detail. Representative Sainz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, thank you for being here today. The uh, pilot you mentioned in terms of the driving-based fees, can that be utilized for airport uh, aid? Uh, no, this, the, pilot we're do, the, the pilot is a mileage-based user fee. So uh, right. that's just, uh, there's no, no revenue being collected. It's just uh, for informational purposes. I think that was thank a play you. on words, yeah. Commissioner. I'm, Hey, y'all been here all day. I had Senator so, Lucas. I, and I appreciate a good dad joke. So, I'll, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, uh, are we going to have to build a new bridge in Savannah? And if so, uh, what is projected cost? Okay. Uh, thanks for that loaded question, Senator Lucas. Uh, and the we, other one, we are, and that's part two. Okay. The finish date on I-75-16. Uh, the answer to the second part is yes, we'll eventually finish. <laughs> <laughs> We have, we have not 
we still have one more section to bid that's probably in next, I think in FY 25 or 26. Is that section designed? Yes, it is ready to go. Thank you. Uh, but thank you for your continued patience in a project that literally has been a decade. And we knew it, we knew it would be a decade when we started. As it relates to the Cable State Bridge or the Talmadge Bridge in Savannah, we are actively under contract with a designer and a specialty contractor to look at, we have to replace the cables due to maintenance. They're 30 years old, it's time to upgrade the cables and replace them, which is a normal thing to do. While we're doing that, we're gonna see how much we can raise the bridge up to help support GPA getting larger ships uh, under that bridge that can support a 16,000 U, 14 and 16,000 TEU ship. So we're just getting started on that. Uh, just made that selection announcement last month. And over this calendar year, we'll be doing the engineering and the, basically we're bringing the contractor and the engineering to, together to come up with how they can actually accomplish that and how much. So, so Commissioner, are you saying that when we go over that bridge, we're all gonna need to raise our hands like this? That would help. <laughs> we're gonna close it out with Chairman Prince. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner, for your briefing. Uh, also, thanks for Josh. We uh, appreciate you lending them to us to uh, help service. But my question is, uh, based on the uh, new truck weight allowances and things like that, did you project anything in your budget uh, to maybe help with some of the bridges and some of the uh, possible outcomes? Cer certainly that capital construction ad will uh, help on bridges and maybe help move some bridges forward as it relates to replacing bridges and then the additional Elmig money to cities and counties certainly could be of, of help. Uh, so they, they'll be getting about double. Each, if each city and county, when you go back home or if you get reached out to your city and county, we're, we'll post something hopefully very quick of what $200 million does, but it's almost it's about 90% of what they're getting now. If you, wanna, if you wanna give them a rough math, that could help t toward go toward replacing bridges and what have you. Thank you, Commissioner, and I want to give a shout out to your Chief of Staff. He's very patient with me and probably many of us, and he makes you look good. So. He, sure, he sure does, and I'm very grateful for him. With that, y'all, we are. Do you have any closing comments, Chairman Tillery? No. Uh, make sure you bring your jacket tomorrow. I know it was real cold in here today. Y'all, thank you. We can start up in the morning at 8 o'clock. we got a full day tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>